Hey, hey, how's everybody doing? Check if my audio is working. Apparently it is. Hey, how's everybody? Hopefully you can hear me. It seems to be functional at least, sorta. And so far only Palm 57 in chat. But anyway, welcome Palm. And just got a follow as I was starting up here. Aika. Wow, that's a... Aika Unermov. Unermoy. Yeah, there we go. Pika Unermoy. Wow, that's a complicated name. And two hours ago, it was Chop and Drop. Also, both of you, welcome aboard. So, Palm 57, salutations. Cajun Josh. Yeah, we all here. Good stuff. Blue Flyer 06, morning. In the world's the largest open source streaming platform. Yes, I know, right? <laughs> that was a good one. <laughs> Pretty spicy way to spicy way to publish your source code. Um, in fact, I had I just got a message a couple hours ago from Twitch uh, that they had to change my streaming key just as a security precaution. So apparently, yeah. So I wasn't entirely sure if the stream is going to start up fine, but fortunately, it did. I, I replaced the streaming key inside of OBS. Yes, finally supporting op open source. Open source streaming platform. What a pile of... What a fail that is on uh, Twitch's part. Showing that thing you showed us today has never been seen <laughs> before ever. Uh, really? I mean, perhaps. Um, perhaps it was never done before ever. But yeah, let's start up a ZSM. And I think I'm gonna make it like look like that. Let's see, did it actually work? Not quite. No. There we go. That's the proper scene. Resize it about there. Good stuff. I haven't seen it, but it's made CL650 pilot get all giddy. Well, I wouldn't really call it all that revolutionary, but it's it's a fun one. Oh, giddy. <clears throat> no, so I, I'm working on the failure module in the aircraft, or rather... I'm essentially done with it. There are some corner cases that I still need to handle, but I've sort of been working on this thing for two weeks straight and I sort of burned myself out on it. So I'm going to carry and move on to other things in the airplane that need to be done. Our fancy pants new fixed um, glare shield here. So when I sit sort of in the proper spot here, let me actually go like this. I need to adjust the default seating position yeah i can see all the screens here just about barely and um pretty much well you might need to play around with the eye alignment indicator but yeah pretty much can see the whole thing so good stuff the layer shield's been adjusted it was a little bit too flat sorry for bobbing my head around all that much but Hey, Reflected Reality Sim, welcome, welcome, and Camero as well. How y'all doing? Let me know how, how your day was. Yeah, uh, what did I want to do? Right, this thing. So, the failure manager. I've basically done it such that it's sitting right here in the standard menu, edit failures, but instead of bringing up the crusty x plane, which you can still bring up, you can still go in like this. But this no longer does anything, like nothing. Um, we don't only actually. There's a couple of failures that I still got to implement that go through the default failure system, I guess. Interior textures. Um, they were there, I think, last stream, but they're better now. Yeah, Gordon's done a lot of work on them. Still got a bunch of work to do, so they're not finished, but they're getting there. 
Gorons get a lot. The most important feature on the aircraft is that we now have a footrest here. So that's really important. I guess you can put your feet up. Let me see. Where do I want to put my view? Yeah, sure. Sort of like that. Perfect. Uh, just about there. Perfect. Yeah, you, you would be a little bit closer to there for, um, I guess, real flight purposes. So I'm going to sort of position it a little bit further out to the right just because it's a bit more convenient on a screen. The footrest is what you're talking about. <laughs> yeah. Yes, reflective reality sim. It, it looks. We might, I think this is pretty well where it should be. So we just might need to pull this little forward, this uh, white idle, idle, idle alignment ball maybe down a little bit further so that it sort of sits about right, or it sort of matches. But yeah, I'm pretty sure that we got the eye alignment here very close to perfect, or rather the, the shape of the glare shield. Yeah, when you sit here, you can just about see the top of the glare shield, just barely. And you got a good view outside. You got a good view inside. You could even position the view up and down and stuff like that. You know, some people fly with it fairly far down to, I don't know, I guess, be able to reach the CDU. Yes, exterior night lighting equipment. Ah, uh -huh, yeah, so... This thing, huh? Yeah, I need to put one more condition, one more, one more section in here. So let me actually count them up. Um, I have, I have a script or a one-liner for that. Grab fail failures dot and so there are thirteen hundred and ninety-three failures currently coded into the plane. Now, a lot of them are, there's about 500 of them that are basically just bus devices where it can fail individual components, individual electrical components, that is. But a decent chunk of them are fairly unique. Hey, Sparker in VR, how are you? So, this is a multi layered, um, multi layered list of things that you can fail. So we've got, it's organized by ATA chapter here in the systems submenu, nav aids, or just, you know, failing nav aids, but systems submenu is organized by ATA chapter. So if you've got your ATA chapter reference handy, you can quickly reference. Oh, I've also put the names in there. I might actually expand a couple of them, make them a little bit more spacious because I've got a little bit of room here. And these are essentially all the ATA chapters that I need. So indicating and recording, I might expand with a space in there, ice and rain protection. I might put a couple of spaces in there. Fire protection. So a couple of these I'm going to put in extra spaces. Is something more comprehensive than I've ever seen. It's the little things. Yes. <laughs> so shall we do the party trick? I wanted to, am I going to put this at the tail end of the stream or am I going to show you now? I don't know. Um, so ATA chapters organized here so air conditioning auto flight communications electrics fire protection flight controls fuel hydraulics ice and rain protection indicating and recording landing gear uh, lights navigation oxygen pneumatics apu engine and then inside of engine we've got several subcategories uh, between left and right so that'll be Engine, fuel and control, ignition controls indicating exhaust, oil, and starting. So, and of course, for a lot of these, so this is not just top level. So, for a lot of these electrics, we've got third levels. You can't fail individual fan blades, unusable. Hey, James EGCC, or should I call you James Manchester? I hope that's Manchester, right? EGCC, I think it is. Um, so for many of these, you got subcategories, AC network, DC, normal network, DC, essential AC. And th then these are individual electrical buses in the aircraft. So AC bus one, two utility one and two essential DC bus one and two 
DC utility one and two, DC essential battery bus, APU battery direct bus, main battery direct bus, and emergency bus. Another thing he showed us yesterday, remember the engine thing? Yes. Um, those are in the final category here. So fire protection. So this is where I need to add a couple more things for wing. Um, Anti-ice and wheel fires are something I got to implement. Um, then we got flight controls. So you got primary flight controls, secondary flight controls, and flaps. Fuel. We've got we've got all the various. Remember the engine thing. Yes. Um, so storage, feed, motive system, transfer system, refuel, defuel system, sensors. So these are all failures you can set on the aircraft. Hydraulics, ice and rain protection for the, your air data probes, the windows, and the ice detectors. You got indicating and recording. That's basically just the ICAS and all these sort of central data now routing. I guess I could add a couple more devices in here that you could fail, like the IAPs, the, notably the IOCs. I don't think I have, or is that in here? No, that's not in here. So we got landing gear. And uh, let's see, landing gear, you can obviously fail into the control units. You can fail any of the mechanical parts of the, uh, of the, uh, of the landing gear and stuff like that. Your cockpit controls for landing gear, so you can um, either disconnect the, the landing gear handle from the input, or you can literally just jam the handle in place. So right now, even though the, since the aircraft is depowered there, the solenoid, the downlock solenoid on the handle here is not held in place. I can cycle the handle. I go ahead and jam it in place. Oh, hang on, did I forget to implement this? I think I might've forgotten. So good thing we checked. And uh, this will just disconnect the parking brake handle. So even though you're gonna be able to pull it, that uh, just means, oh <laughs> yeah, we got some manuals down there. Um, even though you'll be able to pull it, it won't actually hold pressure. So the aircraft would roll away on its own anyway. Lights, and yes, you can fail any of the lights on the inside of the cockpit. Uh, I, I don't know, should I make things like the ambient lighting, like this dome light here, and there's a couple of little you know, floodlights up in here under this grill. Should I make those failable? Would that serve any training purpose? Yes, I noticed. I'm not taking a left seat on this plane. Oh, come on. Um, it's not that hard to fly. So these are all the individual overhead lamps. So overhead glare shield lamps, FCP would be, uh, that'd be your, your autopilot panel. So this is what Collins calls the FCP. Then your supplementary ground wing anti-ice, pedestal lights, co-pilot side panel. And then of course we got the exterior lighting system. So all the exterior lights are also individually failable. So then we got navigation. This is where all your all your sort of major avionics will be sitting. So air data compute or air data probes. You can like plug up a pitot tube. Um, you can block a static port. You can fail each individual air data computer or only one of its input sensors. EFIS. So that'll be your electronic flight information, flight instrument system. So that'll be your screens and your, your, your pieces of the pieces of the controls here, DCP, CCP. I should probably make like nicer images of these. Um, radio altimeters, radios or nav radios, I guess. Uh, GPS, do I want to make a nice little background for this image? I'm not sure, what, what would a GPS look like? Hmm. And then, of course, any of the flight management systems. Are we going to be able to fly this bird with someone next to us, Captain and FO style? Avgeek himself, I'm going to make that, uh, I'm going to work on that after release. I'm not sure that's going to be, I'm going to be able to make that before globe background. That's a good idea, Kurgohan. That's not a bad idea. Um, Avgeek himself, I'm going to work on that after release. Uh, I'm probably not going to be able to make that happen before it's... Uh, it will require probably, it would probably put another couple months on the release. So 
I'd rather release it a little bit earlier, let you guys fly it, and then uh, after a couple of months, I'll, I don't know, well, I'm not promising that it's gonna be a couple of months, but after release, I'm gonna work on the multi-crew, because that is definitely something that I do wanna be doing. They, they, um, we do have an automated sort of flight uh, first officer built in, but um, for, for, uh, Practic for real training value, you would probably want an actual person in there that you could talk to and stuff. So you got, are you able to provide your own multi-crew function like or something? I'm going to be hooking up to shared flight, Curry Gohan Sim. I had a look at uh, shared flight and it's a pretty good, it's very good in terms of uh, stability of flight, which is really what I'm, I'm looking for. I'm going to do all the systems and and interactivity sync myself, all I'm looking for, for sh from shared flight is to provide a good network a connection and to handle the sync of the positions of the aircraft. And it, from what I've seen, it does that pretty well. So I'm happy with, with just using shared flight. Um, so you can fail your individual CDUs. You can actually just fail the connection from a CDU to the flight manager computer, which means any functions that the CDUs have um, that is, independent of, of connecting to the, to the FMC is still going to be there. So for instance, uh, the CDUs not only talk to the flight manager computers, but they also talk to the CMU, the, your, your communications management unit, which is essentially the um, thing that provides a cars, uh, CPDLC and all the sort of networking functionality of the aircraft. And the CMU then connects to a bunch of data interface radios to provide the uh, to provide the um, functionality to, to talk to, to talk to you know outside to the outside world. So normally CMU a CMU prefers running over VHF data radio, so VDR over here VHF three, but it can also talk over SATCOM. So we've got two. We've got essentially um, you have to understand when you purchase the aircraft for real, the real thing. Um, you have to select what sort of data communications capabilities you want on the aircraft. So I think the CMU is pretty much a standard and VHF3 radio is a standard, but anything else, any of these satellite options are up to you. Uh, you can select between a Inmarsat, so this would be geostationary satellite, Iridium, which is um, polar orbit satellites. Um, and then there's a third option here for HF, uh, for high frequency data link HFDL that is usually used for um, long range VHF, long range data link in case you don't have VHF and you don't have satellite. But um, we've pretty much kitted out the airplane as best as we could. So essentially all the most expect, expensive options are on the aircraft, so to speak installed if you were purchasing a real one. So we've got dual satellite data link, which obviates the need for a HF radio. Uh, we've got Inmarsat provides excellent connectivity up to about 70 degrees north latitude. Iridium provides a backup, a, a 2.4 kilobit backup everywhere around the planet, r regardless of where you are, <clears throat> even polar regions. In fact, it works best around the poles. So these two together give you complete global data link coverage anywhere on the planet. And VHF3 just provides a faster link when you're over ground, when you're talking to a, a VHF uh, a VDL mode 2 station. That one's even faster than in Marsat or Iridium. But <clears throat> these two provide you essentially complete global coverage. And they're faster than HFDL. HFDL works, but it is slow. Like, oh my God, is it slow. Um, Iridium is 2.4 kilobits. HFDL, high frequency data link, you're talking hundreds of bits per second. So something like, you know, 400 to 800 bits per second is HFDL data link bandwidth. So horribly slow. Um, compared to that, Radium is, is, is a speed demon and Inmarsat is just insanely fast. Inmarsat, the radios on board only talk at about 10 kilobits per second, or rather the avionics only talks at about 10 kilobits per second, really for flight for avionics purposes, that is plenty fast enough. Um, in fact, VHF3 is super fast. VDL mode 2 does 31.5 kilobits per second. In Marsat, only about 10, 9.5, something like that. But um, the there's a faster piece of software, piece of hardware in the STU that doesn't talk to the avionics. That's for cabin entertainment 
in the back. And that gives, I think it's 500 kilobits per second per channel to something like cabin Wi-Fi over, over satellite. And you can bundle up multiple channels. So if I remember right, Inmarsat advertises this as capable of up to about two to three megabits per second for an aircraft for, for cabin Wi-Fi, which is, you know, it's not super fast, but it'll get you, it'll get you through a video conference. It'll get you to stream like 720p video just fine. Um, so th that'll, that, that's essentially what's used for cabin Wi-Fi. And the avionics just has a 10 kilobit tap off, off of the uh, data link system internally. An L, -L, L band satellite. I've mentioned this before. Inmarsat has a faster option than this, but we're simulating the somewhat old uh, at this point. I mean, like avionics wise, still pretty modern, but at this point, it's about 10 years old is the system, the, the system called um, L band. Well, L band is the, the, the band in which it communicates, but it's, it's Inmarsat L band. There's a much newer one called Inmarsat KA band or GIA, GX or something like that. And that one's a lot faster. Anyway, where was I? Nav, right. Navigation. Then you got your oxygen system. And so you can fail, block each of the masks. We can do an internal tank leak, uh, a, a very a slow one and a fast one. And we can actually pop the tank out of the side of the aircraft. And I'm going to show you what that looks like because I've animated this. Uh, pneumatics. So we got 10th stage and 14th stage, various valve failures and, and stuff getting stuck in stuff. Then we got your APU. APU failures. These are generally fairly straightforward. And we've got truckloads of engine failures, obviously for the separately for the left and right engine. Did I make these above or below these? I'm not entirely sure. Left or right. The display first or second in the list. Opinions in chat, please. Um, so you got your, basically this is like structural stuff. Um, so, you know, you've got your, you get either high vibration on the individual rotors or we can get a compressor stall. You can get a, comp com so these are basically organized by fan and, fan and rotor. Um, rather it's, it's rotor stuff, compressor stuff, combustor stuff. So combustion instability, we got a transient flame out, we got a permanent flame out. And then of course we also can basically just lock up the rotors entirely, basically jam them in place. Good stuff. So then we got your uh, fuel and control. That'll be your, your essentially stuff pertaining to the fuel control unit on the air, on the engine. So things like, um, the N1 speed control is normally when you're above 79% N1, the engine goes into what's called an N1 controlled mode. So there's a little electronic box here. It's fairly stupid. It's just an analog feedback. But what it does is it basically control, gives additional input to the main fuel control unit, which is governed by the N2 core speed, not the fan speed. And uh, norm, th the problem there would be if you were, so I'm gonna show you here, if you were, say at high power, which is most of the time, you know, you're, you're running the engine at fairly high power. Um, you would get a slight split in the fan speeds and I can actually demonstrate that. So why don't we just, I mean, we're in the simulator, we can just go ahead and power, power up the airplane. I can demonstrate the issue. So do I have separate throttles? Theoretically I could, let me, Stand by, I'm gonna grab my physical throttle levers here. Got an X55 Cytex, Cytec. And where do I put you? Gotta put you somewhere around here, or around the mic or something. Uh, this is pretty precarious. Almost there. Score, more or less. Um, good stuff. And... We just hook it up. See if I explain. Notices it. So you work and you work. Good. So I've got independent throttle control. Neat. So let's fire up ZAPU.
Come on, Mr. APU. What are the audio levels like? It's super quiet. Let's try like this. Hopefully it's not going to blow your ears out. Aileron Mon. Yes. Aha. Uh -huh. What is that? Good question. I can explain. It's the Aileron PCU Anti-Jam Monitor. Or Jam Monitor. Uh, I'm going to explain in a sec. Beep. Okay. Wasn't that too loud for you guys? Okay, that seems to be okay in terms of noise. Um, so, reflective reality sim, keep that in mind. Remind me if I forget to explain what Aileron Mon is. Okay, let me get rid of this. That's all aligning, good stuff. We're going to just go ahead and fire up the engines. We're going to go ignition A. Juice up the hydraulics here. And I gotta go and first you gotta go and mash the pedals. So mash pedals down. Where are you? Huh. I gotta check. This should not be this misaligned. Anyway, you gotta mash the pedals down. Then you pull up the parking brake. Then you can release the pedals to lock the pressure in. Hey, Noc33, how are you? In fact, per, before I did that, I should really have checked hydraulics here, make sure that we got the inboard brakes pressurized. Well, that's all good. And then you do your nav, your beacons, and you tell everybody to get away from the aircraft. And then we just spin them over. That my fault. I th I'm... I'll check. I'm not entirely sure. It isn't on the left ones here. These are fine. There might be something with me. I don't know. I'll check why they're so, so misaligned. Hey, Captain Crash. How are you? Okay, we got a right engine. Let's get another one. Make that two, as they say. Morning, you just got up. Ah, oh, I see. I'm doing well myself, Nanak 33. Great to hear everybody's doing well. Good stuff. We got two engines running. I'm going to leave the generators off. I don't really care. And I'm going to show you. So these two switches here, they call them engine speed. What they do is they control that um, N1 control unit. And they basically, you can shut it off in case it's, it's defective. And so normally below 79% N1, the engines are N2 governed. Um, what that means is that the fuel control unit basically just targets a given core speed and just holds that and adjusts fueling um, based on your input lever position and stuff like that to just keep a constant N2 speed. But if I, I'm gonna gas up the engines here a little bit, try and match them close as I can. And did I get very lucky with the engines being very similar in terms of performance? No, not quite. Not close enough. Oh, it, almost. Stand by. Cool. So if I... Damn it, I must have gotten very lucky with the engines being very close. So, okay, let's, uh, let's simulate that my engines are a little bit uh, worn out and that I have a slightly 
or differently worn out, so I'm gonna get them up a little bit. Yes, I know. Ah. He's gonna keep on complaining about it. I'll just look, release the parking brake and get the flaps out. Oh yeah, you can kind of see it here. But you'll notice here that at high power, I've got the N2s almost perfectly matched up. I'm just gonna just slightly push N2 up just a little bit more. That's too much. But basically, so at high power, one of the issues is you get a, a compressor side to side, different speed. And what that generates, you hear that? You hear that wah, 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 wah. Now it does, I'm gonna make it a little bit louder. So that is extremely annoying. And it's because of a 0.5% discrepancy in rotational speeds. And if we have a look at the exact rotor speed, you can see exactly what that, where that comes from. It is generated by the fact that the left and right engines, the, the N1 spools, are they're about 40 RPMs apart, right? 30, 40 RPMs. That means that means that the noise that the engines are generating is slowly going uh, cool. is slowly going um, in and out of phase from each other, and that then causes constructive and destructive interference. But it changes over time, so you just get that kind of that kind of like flanger effect. It is very very annoying. So what? Um, basically the the n1 speed control what that does is it, it takes over at high power and it basically backs off a little bit but the idea being is that if i have if i match up the handles here at least get them as close together as i can basically sort of matched up what the hell so if i get the handles matched up in my hand it essentially gives very close to the same speed, compressor speed. And I don't get that flanger effect anymore. Yes, it's very close to a synchronizer, Mike Char Tango Charlie. It's essentially, uh, well, sort of. Uh, I'm gonna explain it in a little bit more detail. So now you can see you've got different ITTs. We got slightly different N2s. I just got lucky because the engines are very similar today, but um, they can be quite far apart to get the same uh, sort of performance or the same sort of N1 speed. So it, w the way the N1 control works is it basically backs off. It, it has a down, it only can do a down adjustment on the fuel control unit. So the, the fuel control normally tries to target a higher speed, a higher engine speed, and it just backs it off. What's the difference between this device and the N2 sync, huh? So that's another system, that's the ATS. So the auto throttle system, um, frankly, I don't know why the ATS has an N2 sync function because I couldn't really imagine why anybody would use that. Sort of, I can sort of see why, but well, not really. Um, so if we have, um, let's see. Okay, so ATS N2 sync. So this is for manual throttle control, right? It's just for pilot convenience. This system predates uh, auto throttle being on the Challenger. This was here probably at least in, since CL604, perhaps even CL601. If you're talking, you know, 80s, um, 1984, 1985 Challengers already had this kind of a system on board, um, but they didn't have auto throttle. Auto throttle became standard with the Challenger 650 and the Challenger 605 and 604 have it optional. So it's basically designed to give pilot convenience when flying, especially on manual throttles, which on older Challengers was essentially all of the time. Um, on modern Challengers, generally not that big of a deal anymore, not really required, um, or rather 
not that big of a deal anyway. And it's all because of the fact that the CF-34 engines do not have a FADEC. So there is no full authority digital control. There's only a hydromechanical fuel control unit and uh, this electronic fan and one, what they call the fan control amplifier is, a, is the really the official name. So even though I abbreviated it here to engine N1 control, what it, the official name is the N1 control amplifier. So how would a failure of that system look? What would a failure of that system look like? Well, I'm going to juice up the engines a little bit here, get it into N1 control. So as I said, below 79%, we're not N1 controlled, but above it, we are. So that's basically most of the flight regimes. So you could have an N1 control failure that looks something like this, an erratic N1 control. The N1 control is being a complete idiot and is not maintaining a stable N1 speed. I'll match up the handles here as close as I can, but the stupid thing isn't holding the speed. You don't want the engines to be doing this all the time, essentially. They don't really like being, you know, constantly accelerated down, decelerated, accelerated, decelerated. So in that case, what you would do is you, if you had an, un, uh, an unstable N1 or faulty N1 control, first of all, you disconnect the ATS, then you back up the faulty side a little bit, and you'll kill the N1 control. You'll see that the engine will jump up in terms of speed because now the N1 control normally retards the fueling. So as soon as we take it out completely, it basically now switches over into direct FCU control. Now we have quite the throttle split, but now the engines are stable. I could take both of them actually out if I wanted to. Does that condition cause wear? Uh, no, currently it doesn't cause uh, cascade failures. So the system is not... I'm basically sort of designing this more for training purposes where you do not want to have unexpected stuff happening. What the hell? I got the auto FO, don't I? I know I don't. Do any of my buttons here? I might have buttons bound to this. Hang on. Uncalibrated device. Okay, there we go. Well then, nothing. Oh yeah, I got a truckload of buttons. Do nothing. Man, there's a lot of buttons. You're flying a, cru a cruise now, a CRJ now, yeah. So this is what a faulty N1 control would look like. Now you'd have to sort of fiddle around with it in a flight occasionally to get it to sit where you want it to sit. And if you don't get it right, so pull it back a little bit there. Because if you don't get it right, you get that one, 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 one sound. So by accident, I got it to sit well. So, faulty M1 control right there. And of course, we can also get the thing stuck, which will generally prevent the thing from operating it from... It will try and give us a reduce a reduction in power as hard as it can. Now it does have limited authority, so it cannot, you know, retard the engines to like stopping, but you can see here, not really letting me line them up correctly. So even though I have the, the knobs here lined up well, actually not even, well, it's given, it, well, we might be able to push it into takeoff power, but it's misbehaving. 
I want to say it never worked right. Yeah, okay. That's a different story then. Good stuff. And of course we can get your you can get your NT speed control or your fuel control unit in general you can can be, you know, doing stupid stuff. Man, that was a long tangent just talking about one of the subcategories in here. Ignition stuff, you know, failure to ignite or a very weak ignition system where eventually it might light, but it will take a long time to get a strong enough spark in there. Fuel controls, so we can go ahead and, you know, jam one of the thrust levers. So now I'm pushing both levers forward. Well, only one of them is moving. This is great fun when it happens at high power. Now, eh, you try and move the throttles, it won't. Obviously, the ATS won't either. From a program perspective, you have to custom code all these failure states and behaviors. An insane amount of work. Uh, yeah, most of them. Well, not most of them. Some. I don't know, probably two-thirds of them, give or take. But yes, essentially custom code everything here. None of this is using any of X-Plane's default stuff. Not even the nav eight failures. Then we can also do a fun one, which is just disconnect the cables. So, say, so these things are sitting... Um, there's a big throttle quadrant in here with servos and everything. Um, or as one of our pilots called it, a magnificent Rube, Rube Goldberg device down here. And uh, then there's a bunch of throttle cables, steel cables that go back to the engines. So what if we broke one of them? Well, you can still move the throttles, but the FCU input is no longer going to move. So that's now screwed. Reconnect the cable, and there we go. Indicating system. We can fail any of the indications. So N1 not available. Or, if we gas the engines up, usually most of these failures make sense when you're like in flight and stuff, not sitting on the ground, you know, messing around with stuff. You can make the N1 indications be erratic, because this is an analog sensor. So we can say that the sensor is a little bit screwy, or rather the connection from the sensor to the sampling input is, is screwy. You can make the N1 vibe indication fail. This now goes to zero. And if I do a vibration test, I only get one side coming up. This other side isn't doing anything. You can fail the ITT sensor. And exhaust. Now this was fun. This took me a couple of hours to code many of these. Um, so you can, now this will make sense in flight. You can unlock and basically release the, the thrust reversers in flight, which is great fun. You can do a thrust reverser uncommanded deploy. Huh, hang on, no, we don't have, we don't have 14 stage pressure. So there we go. And now if I go do thrust reverser uncommanded deploy, thrust reverser unlocked, I go outside. See, you won't blow your ears out. Okay, no, you're good. This was an uncommanded deploy and thrust reverser. And a valve has failed. Does it just go to zero or does the DC receiving computer flag it has failed after? And Amy, it depends on the device. Also, hi, a bit late of the party. <laughs> Don't worry about it. Um, depends on the device. Um, for things like ITT N1 and that stuff, it basically just goes to zero. For it, for these sensors, it, it doesn't measure anything. For stuff like fuel flow, oil pressure, those will go dashed if those fail. In fact, I should probably fail. The, I forgot to make those failable, huh? Yeah. No, or did I want to put those in oil here? Hmm. These were fun. So these are mechanical stuff. So I should probably make that in 
put that in. No, no, hang on. Those would go into 79 oil. I'll, I'll have to check the, the ATA chapters. We can make the oil pump be supremely weak. Engine oil. Engine oil. Engine oil. Engine oil. Engine oil. It's pissed off. Engine oil. And that is not just an indication. So these are mechanical faults. So I go ahead and bring up the engine state here. We'll go into the oil system. Watch this. This is your pump rate, flow rate. And the reason why that oil pressure goes down is because the pump just barely pumps anything anymore. Engine oil. And since there's very little flow, there's very little back pressure through all the passage restrictions here, causing a low oil pressure sensor indication. So that then causes your engine essentially to overheat. But it still indicates a little bit, so if I go ahead and speed up, you'll see that the pump still works a little bit. The oil pressure still goes up. But what you'll also notice is that the bearings keep heating up here. And eventually at about 450 degrees, they're gonna seize up. So this does have a cascade knock-on effect where it'll seize up the rotor or the affected rotor. It might be the N1 or the N2 rotor there independently. Um, control. Also your oil temp here is gonna eventually start skyrocketing because of the fact that it's gonna be pouring extremely hot oil 240 degree oil into the oil tank and there's very little flow over the oil cooler so that one doesn't really do very much if i go ahead and reset it it'll restore the original flow 22 quarts a minute and now we go so the bearings are not cooling off the oil in the oil tank actually is ironically heating up because of the fact that we're just ejecting a truckload of hot oil out of the engine into the oil tank but you see it, it already stopped and now it's going to start coming down on the oil temp interesting little correlations you can find in this huh and of course you, your standard hung start and hot start tm failures so shut off the engines here i should probably have waited for them to cool off since i've been sort of giving them a good amount of work uh, yeah, they're going to be fairly hot, but I think they'll survive. They won't seize up. If you do an extremely hot shutdown uh, with no extra cooling, it might seize up the rotors as well. Let's see. Right, this one's a fun one. Yes, 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 I know. So y'all know what this is, huh? I mean, it says there, right, right there, oxygen relief. So that is your oil, sorry, that is your oxygen tank relief valve because the oxygen tank for the crew sits right around here behind that wall. It's basically behind like a false wall inside of a, a clothes hanger. Um, and uh, it holds quite a lot of oxygen in there. It holds like four kilograms or almost 10 pounds of oxygen under 2000 PSI. It depends a little bit on the temperature of the cabin and stuff. Would it be worth demonstrating the thrust reverse or yank? Yes, we can do it. We can do that. Absolutely. In fact, I, I've had to code some stuff for, for my integration here with your virtual throttles. Do another startup. A little bit unhappy because the oil is hot inside of the engine. But it'll stabilize itself. One of the funny things that doesn't happen when you've got a hot engine is you don't get that sort of on startup. So that's also simulated. That's only on a cold start. Startup number two. 
close enough. I think I have I've been abusing the right engine a little bit less, so it's not quite as warm. You simulate the bird strike like the TBM. Not yet, small gr small grin. Uh, I should probably. Yes, Gen one and two off. So there's a system inside of the if you're in flight. Let's say you've got your throttles at fairly high power. There we go, that's about, you know, whatever, kind of flight power. And you got an uncommanded thrust reverser deployment. Now what could happen is you would all of a sudden get a huge yank to the, you know, the inactive side. Because all of a sudden the engines at high power would be producing a truckload of reverse thrust. So there's a system inside of the engines where when the thrust reverser cowl is translating, there's what they call feedback yoke inside of that that is linked to the fcu input cable uh thrust lever input cable and it basically y yanks the throttle lever backwards uh, during that thrust reversal deployment so even if you were if even if you had a little bit of a, a little bit of uh, what the hell did that thing do even if you had a little bit of thrust reverse or, or, or forward thrust as you pull the thrust reversers up um let me just see here i'm gonna arm them i'm gonna show you manually what that would look like um, it won't let me deploy them. I'm not quite at close enough to idle, I guess. There we go. So I basically pulled my thrust lever back. But if you had an uncommanded deployment, so let's go like this. Let's disarm them. Everything's, you know, everything's fine. Everything's good. Happy. And we all of a sudden get an uncommanded thrust reverser deployment. So we're going to go into engine, 78 exhaust, thrust reverser, uncommanded deploy on pressing control F. And so I can go ahead and control F. You'll see it immediately yanked the thrust reverser lever backwards as it was going basically through the translating state. Now, that does not mean you cannot pull it back forward. You can, you shouldn't. But what I've done to prevent it accidentally, you know, or, or automatically slamming back forward when it resyncs or when it, when you get back like you know, flight alert control, um, it, 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 we basically um, disconnect the sync between your virtual and your physical throttle. So, you know, this is my physical throttle. I can, if I wanted to, I could go back and push it back forward, but now I'm increasing reverse thrust. In flight, that'll be catastrophic, obviously. In reality, there's no such thing as having to sync up a physical and a virtual throttle, because obviously it just pulls your physical throttle back and, you're de and that's, th that's that. But um, that is a thing in the model as well. So go ahead and stow the thrust reverser. And we can re-advance power back to normal. Good stuff. Now, hopefully I didn't heat up the engines again too hard. Now, yeah, we'd have to wait a couple of minutes. Normally after applying power, you're supposed to wait three minutes before shutting down at the region is getting to bed have a good one leading edge wonderful work on the cockpit so far looking forward to the cabin and all the rest of the stuff take care man so normally you're supposed to wait three minutes and the reason for that is essentially you want to let the core of the engine cool off enough such that when you shut it down, it's not going to overheat the resident oil, basically that gets trapped inside of the BNC sumps here in the hot section of the engine. So I'm going to wait for two minutes. I didn't really gas the engine too hard, so this should be pretty well. Okay, there. And shut down. Have a good one, Gordon. It should be on BOD, this stream, so not a problem. If you want to watch later. Cool. Wonderful. 
So one of the things that can happen, so as I was talking about the oxygen system here, the oxygen tank is, is at a fairly good amount of pressure. In fact, if I go ahead and, well, I'd have to cool the cabin down pretty hard, so it would take a while. Right now, the oxygen tank is fairly hot because the cabin was hot. So the pressure went up inside of it, obviously. Normally, this will sit between 17 and 1800 PSI, is sort of the design pressure for that oxygen tank. Um, but it can obviously sustain more. And if you've ever, we've been sort of discussing this on Discord, but in case anybody didn't see, um, you notice that that tank doesn't look exactly very smooth. Why is that? Anybody know? <laughs> so anyway, there's about, you know, 10 kilograms, or I'm sorry, like four and a half kilograms, 10 pounds worth of oxygen in there. Designed to rupture. Well, as the tank rupture, that would not be a good thing. Captain crashes is, is, of course, he knows the answer, so he's kind of spoiling the fun. Yeah, this is a COPV tank. Um, pressure fluctuation, yes, of course. <laughs> yeah, Amy, orbit, that too. Um, now, the reason why I was asking why it's sort of rigid like that is because, uh, yeah, you cheated. Um, this is, so normally these tanks are, would be, we, we sort of tried and figure out, tried and, and searched the internet for the exact part number that's yeah, inside a Challenger 650. And we figured out why or what it is. Normally a tank like this would weigh somewhere in excess of 50 kilograms, you know, a hundred pounds or more. Um, that is a heavy piece of equipment to have on an aircraft, right? Um, preferably you try and make an aircraft as light as possible to save on fuel and carrying capacity and everything. So uh, instead what they do these days um, is they have the tank is still steel, but is only a thin shell inside, basically to provide a sealing surface. And the outer stuff here that you see, that is carbon fiber mesh. So a COPV is a composite overwrap pressure vessel. Um, COPV tank. And uh, let me show you what it looks like uh, when, it's, uh, when it's sort of made. Oh, there we go. That's a good picture. Can I open this in a new tab? Yes, I can. So. Huh? Why did you show this window? I want you to show this window. Huh? Okay. Hang on. What are you? Oh. Yeah. I didn't want to bring that one. It's just a file browser. So that is what a COPV looks like. Yes. Yeah. SpaceX knows what happens when you submerge that. But this is what a, a COPV looks like um, during manufacture. So it's, you can see the individual sort of uh, fabric strands being wrapped on top of there. And this is underneath. Usually that'll be a, a, a steel either cast or machined or, or extruded one of those um, steel tanks and with a composite overwrap. What that gives you is a very, very, very light tank. Um, a, a COPV tank weighs some, somewhere in the, rea in the region of less than a quarter of a solid steel tank. So a sol if this was solid steel, it would be probably close to 100 pounds. COPV tanks are, there you go, that's it. It's it's very, very light. That's from the side, we'll float it up and punch through. Oh, yeah. Let's say one, boom. Yes. And the whole thing happened in less than a second, obviously, <laughs> in, in the SpaceX accident. But yeah, so it uses a COPV. That's why it's sort of ridgy like that because you see the individual fiber strands. It's then painted green. Green is the universal tank color for oxygen. So 
if any, you know, fire um, firefighters came across this tank, they'd know what it is. So there's color coding for them. Green is by tradition, oxygen, oxygen lines, anything like that. Basically keep fire away from those. You know, remember the steel thickness. I can't remember what we determined it would be. Yeah, it would be something like uh, half an inch cabin crash, something like over 10 millimeters thick would be the steel thickness. That's because it doesn't just have to sustain 2,000 PSI. It has to sustain something like over 3,000 PSI for test pressure or 2,800 PSI. Basically anything, the highest possible pressure that the tank could ever experience, plus like a 50% margin on top. So your DM and Discord all fixed and repost sorted out. Oh, wonderful. Cool. So here you can see the, the tank is currently cooling off because I turned on, I momentarily turned on the cabin, or actually I did turn on, I do have one, uh, one pack going. So the cabin has been cooled off down to 24 degrees. It was 44 degrees when I was sitting outside or when I was sitting just here in the sun. And so now the tank is cooling off and from that the oxygen inside is going to cool off. And that's going to cause the pressure to go down. But one really fast way to drop the pressure um, is to just go ahead. There's a an overpressure disc here. So what this does is if the tank pressure gets above, I think, 2800 PSI, thereabouts, it will blow out automatically. Um, this is a calibrated, you know, essentially a fail ele failure element. But we can simulate a false overpressure sense, overpressure vent blow. Yes, the rupture disc. What I meant as in <laughs> fail element, I, I mean that it should fail at a pre-designed, yeah, it should fail at a pre-designed pressure. But we can simulate it blowing anyway. Let's say you got a faulty disc in there. Don't wait for this weakness in ETA release, still too early. Muldrum, before the year is out, it should be out. Had a few of those blow hurting a SCBS cylinder, so 4,500 PSI. Yeah, that'll be fun. Well, then, Cajun Josh, do let me know if this is the correct way it should look like. Make sure that it's not going to blow your ears out. Good stuff. <laughs> and yeah you could see that momentarily the oxygen or there you go minus 155 degrees celsius yes we do have a diabetic cooling due to gas expansion in there now since there's very little oxygen left in there anyway now it's heating up really fast because you know there's very little mass and it's just basically exchanging heat over with the still very hot tank Watch ice form when it's 100 degrees outside. Yeah, frost. That too. Perhaps I should make the ga the heat exchange a little bit faster. But it's, I mean, it's pulled down like 10 degrees down on the out on the tank temperature. Yeah, now we have no oxygen. PSI, zero, zero PSI gauge. And we got basically nothing in the tank here. Oxygen, low pressure. Very expensive way to cool down your iced coffee. Yeah, <laughs> the late corporate passenger. So we got barely anything in there. And obviously at this point, if I do a, an oxygen mask test, nothing. Nothing happening, obviously, because now we have no oxygen in there. EFB, small grin, I'm going to have, have a tab here and that's it. I don't want to do any of those gimmicky EFBs where you have like 
passenger and fuel configuration. We're gonna do something different. You'll you'll like it. Don't worry. You're gonna you're gonna enjoy that. Yeah, there is gonna be Avatab, obviously. And for passenger loading and everything, we're gonna do something a lot better, I think. Hope <laughs> you're gonna like it. Anyway, clearing the faults now though does not refill the tank. The vent is still blown. We're gonna do it right, yes sir. I still actually gotta tell Goran. I still gotta tell Goran to actually make this thing animated such that I do have the data refs ready for it. Just needs to sort of animate this thing as being burst out. And that is something you do check on a, on a walk around. So when you're running around the aircraft checking for stuff, then one of the things you do check is you make sure you haven't blown the oxygen vent. If you have, you ain't got no pressure in the tank. Checking the burst discs, especially in VR. Yes, sir. So now I need to reload the plane because I assume the fire bottle discs are simulated too. Yes, they are. I don't simulate them like doing a puff of stuff. But yes, we do have engine fire simulated and the bottles are simulated as well. Well, they, their effect is simulated. I should probably make them like expel a bunch of halon gas. I don't know. Okay, so here we are. We should have our oxygen back since I reloaded a fresh copy of the plane. And there we go, 1995 PSI. Blowout discs on the fire bottles. Ah, yeah, I should probably do that too. Good point, Hawker driver. Didn't even figure out how to get Librium and Vulcan yet. You can check this. Um, I think you can. Hang on, no, you know, you'd have to go. No, 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 no. Ah, uh, driver actually. So no, there, there isn't an actual burst disc in on the oxygen tanks because I go through a partially completed cabin. I can show you what, why not. You can check them, but not by looking outside, but. The Challenger has an accessible equipment bay here. And you go in and you can actually see there are pressure gauges right there. I need to actually get Goran to animate those. I do have pressure values for them, but that's what you do is you check the, and there's supposed to actually be another one uh, over about there for the APU. So you check those, check the hell hole. Yes, you do. In fact, I, we're gonna make this thing, this is the battery, the APU battery disconnect, this is the APU battery box, you're gonna make, we're gonna make that thing you, thing you can actually disconnect and you're gonna have to. And also the oil servicing system is gonna be implemented as well. Because I've put in oil consumption now, the airplane does burn oil. And you got the whole oil replenishment procedure printed on a little card. Hey Mateo 0017MT, welcome, welcome. Checking the hell hole in VR, one of the first things I'm gonna do. Sure. Yeah, that's also gonna be simulated. It's already modeled. Um, I need to implement the thing and then it's all a question of getting Goran to basically just tie up the animations. I gotta make the site class actually also work. Cool. So that was gimmick number one. Good for gimmick number two. I'm just quickly sort of rushing through here. I just want to mess around with the plane a little bit. Come on, sort of quick. stuff get that thing cranking and let's go just go ahead and start up number one
Okay. Oh, can you still hear me? Yes, you can. Good stuff. Make it a little bit quieter so you can still hear me. Or the lower the engine. I'm gonna get the engine, you know, up to like high power. Good. So here's a fun one. Failures engine. Engine. We oh, got these lovely three ones. Compressor stall. And you can get a transient compressor stall, one that can be cleared by lower in power, or a non-clearable one. So what would that look like? Let's just go for a quickie. And did I actually set? I'm going to set it up to fairly high power setting. Yeah, you can still hear me. Good. This is close to takeoff power, not quite there, but close. That was a transient compressor stall. Let's go for one that you can clear. I reduce power here. See okay, that cleared up the stall. Let's go for a, <laughs> let's go for one that you cannot get rid of. And for that, I'm going to show you one of the characteristics of the compressor stall is obviously that you lose power. You get these very loud bangs and you also get an ITT excursion. Now this is inside. Oh so I may actually make that a little bit louder. That's what that sounds like. That was a fun one. You can go ahead and set the engine on fire. So we got two uh, fire detection zones inside of the aircraft. We got one in the, uh, basically around the combustor here. And uh, here's how these work. These are essentially um, thermally sensitive resistor wire. Anybody for s'mores? I don't know what that is. Um, so there's a, a, a kind of thermally sensitive resistor wire that closes, uh, reduces in resistance when it gets hot and it goes all the way around the combustor with some space in between because the combustor normally is fairly hot. This thing marshmallows on the flames. <laughs> and then you've got one that isn't, it's, it's not inside of the jet pipe here because obviously the jet pipe gets extremely, hor extremely hot and crack of chocolate marshmallow and singing kumbaya but it's sitting in just inside of the cowl but inside of the you know the, the inner cowl here but not inside of the actual jet pipe so if you've got a jet pipe uh, fire here or rather inside of the inside of the cavity we're about to have some more flames yeah so one of the funny things or one of the things that i find really weird is a lot of people when they simulate an engine fire they make fire come out of the exhaust that's not an engine fire that's basically a, a tailpipe conflagration or i guess a tailpipe fire but as long as the fire you know as long as the fire stays inside of the primary gas path here it's good that's where we want it to stay you know the fire hot in here is not a problem um, 
hot, hot outside of that, that's when the problems start. So that is why, you know, your, your A detection loop sits around the combustor with a fair amount of space, such that you can detect when the fire gets out of the combustor inside of this cavity here, which is there's a bunch of equipment in here. You've got your kill control unit, you've got your accessory gearbox and all that kind of good stuff. All your, your various little oil lines and stuff that go in here, oil pump, uh, tank reservoirs up over here on this part. Well, it's about there. Um, so there's a lot of equipment here that we do not want to have, you know, consumed by fire, generally a bad idea. Um, so the fire loops detect when there's fire outside of these regions. And that means that the fire does not actually appear until fairly late. It's definitely not going to appear in your exhaust. So when I go ahead and trigger a fire here, Obviously, I'll get a warning about it. You'll see nothing much happens animation-wise. I can see a little bit of smoke starting to rise from the engine, but you know, generally not something you immediately notice. But we're definitely starting to conflag conflagrate inside of there. And you gotta wait for quite a while. In fact, let's let's just time it for funsies. I'm gonna clear the fault. And the 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 actual fire indication is gonna take a while to clear out because even though I've now manually extinguished that fire, the fire loop actually takes a little bit of time to cool off. See the boss because we we are smoking. But shouldn't you have fire in both zone A and B for the master warning of the trigger? No. They are separate loops. So these are actually double loops. There are two loops in loop in zone A, and there are two loops in zone B. Is what you're talking about, tail West there. So both loops have to agree in each zone. That's what you mean, tail west. Because there's a separate, different uh, overheat warning for zone B. So, let's go ahead and time it. I'm going to go like this, and when I press Control F, start the timer. Now we got the indication there. Let's just time accelerate through it. So... We got some smoke coming out. Half a minute of burning, nothing much. Still only smoke. And you can see that the smoke ain't coming out of the jet pipe. It's coming basically right out of the bypass duct. Or very, very close to it anyway. It's basically sort of nondescript coming out of various little crevices here. You can probably make it like, I don't know, go at like an angle, like pass by the bypass up. So a minute, close to a minute and a half of burning, still only smoking, 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 because the fire's underneath, right? Fire's inside of that, inside of that tube there. And we wait more. Now we got a jet pipe overheat. Now the fire spread to the jet pipe. Hell west. That's what the second loop B now is. So. Loop B is already overheating as well. Hey, some Caesar. Now we got the iconic. Overheat. Jet pipe overheat. Jet pipe overheat. Jet we got uh, Pilsner's favorite sound coming out of there. So now it says jet pipe overheat as well, not just the engine fire bell. I'd probably blow it back, yeah, I'd probably, well, yeah, go like, I don't know, like there. I should probably make it do that. Realistically, this is more meant for flight, so I'm not really too concerned. Flight, it would still, it, you'd see, it sort of, go backwards anyway. On the fair system, one shot and two to amount of the level of crew training fun down the line. So we've been here for two and a half minutes, and it's still only smoke coming out of the engine.
And yes, uh, the sneaky Danish, this, I pretty much designed this for training purposes. So yes, the system has, as you can see over here, it has two fire bottles available for uh, both engines. So uh, we, can dis we can make a fire that is extinguishable with a single shot, with two shots, or one that is not extinguishable at all. We've been for three minutes and something's starting to change inside of the engine. I can see a little bit of fun starting down there. Now we're finally in over three minutes, three and a half minutes, until we actually start seeing flames coming out of the engine. They're not coming again out of the jet pipe. They're coming out of the bypass duct. Or rather, they're coming basically out of all parts outside of that jet pipe. Now, at this point, if you haven't actually extinguished the first time trying to fly TBMs at the engine of so I can't wait to see what this come out. Yeah, cool. So finally, finally, we can actually get some fire, you know, coming out of all parts of the engine. It'll take, you know, a good few minutes, um, probably 10 minutes or so until the engine is actually completely destroyed. It will eventually seize up and lock up. Okay, so clear to failure. And now we've extinguished the fire, basically just clearing out the remaining smoke. We still got the warning going. Jet pipe overheat. Still waiting for the. There we go. Good stuff. So, what would a fire extinguishing procedure look like? You would, you know, your, your standard procedure. You would. At the engine, push the fire button here, and so like so. Engine fire, so you know, you identify your engine, get it to idle, cut off the power, fire button push, cancel the warning. I got both bottles armed, and go ahead and give it a squirt. So the engine only smoking so far. And let's go ahead and give it a squirt. Engine one low pressure, bottle one low pressure. Still got the engine fire indication. There's still a little bit of smoke coming out, but it's just basically finishing up. Ooh, overheated oil, nice. And there we go. Fire warnings out. What was the state of the engine? How hot did it actually get? Oh, not too bad. The oil, basically, the oil tank got the brunt of the overheating here. Oh yeah. Engine fires. And obviously APU fire, all the other good stuff. But now, since I have an ex an ex an expended bottle in here you would i'm um, currently you, i'd have to reload the plane i might add some sort of interface to basically just refill the plane but i surprised the dentist i've survived the dentist well a good one welcome back pilsnerish so here's your favorite n noise on the airplane jet pipe overheat jet pipe overheat jet pipe overheat jet pipe Overheat. Jet pipe overheat. <laughs> cool. So by having that button pushed in, I basically have armed both bottles. So if I push this button now, we fire the second bottle. Jet pipe overheat. Yes, indeed. And you got your APU fires. The APU only has one bottle for it, so that would be only a single shot. Extinguishable, not, ex not extinguishable. And we can also fail the fire detection loops. So uh, I'm gonna just quickly reload the plane to get a fresh plane with, without all the damage that I've done to it so far. Hi, T.
takes a rack. Um, takes a oh, takes a rack CL650. Ah, uh, welcome, welcome, welcome. So what we can do to demonstrate the system fail faults are where you would have a failure of the fire detection loop. Yeah, it's text. I, I, I understand that it's kind of the name rang a bell in my head a little bit. Cool. So just fired up the avionics here. And I've got, I need to put a, a common click spot for both bottles so you can test them. And it just sticks my head in the hell hole. Yeah. <laughs> Only day one by for me. So you can test both bottles and stuff. Squibs. Oh, I'll take regular water, please. Thank you. Or no, actually tea, please. No, thank you. Uh, no, 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 just in, in my cup. Cool. So bottle test and your fire warning test. Jet pipe overheat. And you got your system failure tests. And obviously, if you've got a failure on the detector, so that'll be section 26. Let's say zone A loop failed. Like that. Left fire fail. So that is the loop itself. And the, te the detector, I need to buy a CLC and FS economy before the price goes up. Yeah, thanks for the tea, Mrs. Toto. Exactly. I always do. I uh, always got to be thankful for that. So this is a detection. So the detector has both the ability to detect fire, but it can also detect if there's a complete dead short inside of that loop. So it basically knows, you know, when the loop is completely faulty, either a, a dead short or an open, open uh, circuit, if it was like cut. So what if we fail the detector though? Now, now it's not reporting anything, but if I do a fail test, you'll see I'm missing left jet pipe fire fail. So that's missing there. Should be four. Should be four of them. In fact, I'm gonna do this so that you can actually see the difference. So I'm missing one of them. It should be five messages. I'm only getting four. And this similarly, I'm only getting jet pipe overheat. I'm not getting a left Jet engine fire. Overheat. Whereas if I clear it, you'll see I'm going to get five messages here and five messages there. If you let the fire burn long enough, will the detectors burn out or make the fire warning go away? Um, Hawker driver? No. I'm not, I'm not doing that, no. It'd be kind of a weird one, to be honest. Um, I don't think there's really much training value in that, to be honest. Let's see, indicating and recording, if I go ahead and kill the left REU channel. And you're probably piping it into both REUs. Oh, huh. I'll have to check. Unless there's a logic of both loop fail, no more stir remain. I'm not entirely sure, Tail West, what would happen in that case. If you just went ahead, if it was still on fire and you just cut the loop, then it might just stop. But I mean, you already know that it is it's having some issues. That reminds me, I forgot to put stall protection in here failure so that's a thing i gotta do because there is this fault here now hang on with just battery power on it i'm not gonna get stall warnings so i gotta get external power on the ship i think that's something that's talked about in mem theory only but at least for the hawker and falcon 20 flight safety folks always talked about retesting your loop after the fire to see if it loops there's still a loop there ah you're in bigger trouble ah yeah it makes sense theoretically i could do that yeah hmm 
mock trim, yacht amper, good stuff. Wonderful. Thank you. Cool. I do have some spicy ones. Let me actually just pull up my joystick here. Some of the spicy ones, you know, obviously you got your flight controls. Oh, uh, what if you got a control wheel jam? So, control wheel is now jammed. And since I'm sitting on the left, I can't. Um, in fact, let's jam both axes. Why not? So, both control wheel and control column are jammed. Wish I still had my G4 QR8. <laughs> there is that procedure. So now I have jammed both axes. And since I'm sitting on the left, still jammed, but I sit on the right, still jammed. Since I've connected both yokes together, they, they are linked by the called torque tube. So pull both handles out. And now I've only got the, the right side, left side, still jammed. In fact, we bring up flight controls. Left side jammed. Right side fine. Actually, I need to pressurize them to actually get them to work, right? Uh, actually, let's fire up all pumps here. So left side jammed, not doing a whole heck of a lot of anything. Right side movable. Only the right side, though. Yes, it's going to complain when you when you do a pull up. Elevator split. And we can also do the same to the rudder pedals. So I'm going to jam the left side rudder pedals. Now, what do you do with the rudder pedals, though, right? So jam the rudder pedals. I'm trying to move them. Nothing happening. Well, it's a little bit, a little bit there is happening, but basically that is just to give you the sense that, okay, something's happening with my controls, but I'm clearly not getting what I'm trying to get. And since the jam is here, I cannot push through and disconnect the pedals. Cause if you notice, there's no rudder disconnect lever here because there's only essentially a shear pin connecting the rudder pedals together. There's still two separate cable corridors for each of these. So you'll see that there are two completely independent sets of controls going back to the flight controls. But um, since I am sitting on the left where, side where the jam is, I can't move it. And if I'm... Yeah, damn it, this is kind of annoying. Ah, I know why. Uh, the left side rudder is slammed forward. Anyway, so I still can quite move, but if I really push hard, so I'm going to show you here on my controls... The control deflections. Oh, come on, explain. If I show you on my control deflections, this is my inputs from my from my uh, my uh, twist stick here. If I jam in really close to full rudder, there we go. Now I've got you know this would obviously be moving. There's just a little bit of breakage there, but that'll be there. That'll be fixed. And probably is already fixed in the repo. Um, so now I do have rudder. Still no rudder on the right, so this thing ain't doing much. Because this, this guy's jammed hard. Right side, though, I can fly from the right side. So now it would be, first officer would be taken over. You'd figure out, you know, obviously who has the working flight controls and that's the person who's going to fly. But you'll notice one thing. Uh, even if I jam in full rudder, You'll notice that the rudder itself only goes to half deflection here on the diagram. Hopefully you can see that. So rudder only goes to half deflection. Why is that? Back. Do I have no nose wheel steering is, is only on the thingy thingamabob over there 
Would it actually? Oh yeah, I do have it bound up such that even if you're on the right side, you can still steer. I might have to disconnect that so that when you're over on the right side, you only get rudder fine steering. So only half rudder when they are disconnected. And even if I clear the failures, come over to the left here. Full rudder input, but only half rudder output. Okay, I'm going to stop sort of making this into a pop quiz. Um, the reason is that there's a summing circuit, well, summing yoke, essentially. There's a me mechanism inside of here, um, in so or close to the P2 input. I won't cheat this time. Because <laughs> there's a summing mechanism inside of there that basically mechanically adds up the two rudder sides to make fun failure scenarios. Yes, sir. Please snap, absolutely. Um, I do, and I will, well, systems actually are just handled, going to be handled on the master side, so the co-pilot side is always just going to follow the master. Anyway, so there's a mechanical summing yoke uh, inside of the tail of the aircraft that mechanically adds up the two individual rudder inputs, and since I have now disconnected the rudders, I cannot uh, obviously... I cannot obviously, uh, or obviously I cannot um, now uh, achieve full input just by moving one set of rudder pedals. So that's why the rudder only goes to half. Now that is by design. That is not just, you know, coincidence and, and, and uh, just a piece of bad design on the part of the aircraft designers. We're gonna add zero MQ whenever you want me. I just need, uh, JSNAP, you don't need to add zero MQ. All I need is a TCP pipe. Basically, nothing more. I'm going to handle the zero MQ on my part, on my side. I just need a port to port transfer between two sides, and that's it. If I, uh, well, no, we do want um, power. Cool. So, I uh, need to power up this, right? So we need system three for rudder functionality or any one of the systems really can power the rudder. Um, it has to triple. I give you a pipe, are you ready to try using it? Um, Jason up, not yet. I haven't been working on this. I'm probably gonna make this happen post-release because um, there's and release is going to happen, you know, within this year. So, um, probably, you know, around winter time, I'm going to be talking to you uh, and getting this stuff working. It shouldn't be on your part. It's probably going to take less than a day of work to, to give me a TCP pipe. It's mostly going to be me figuring out where all the bugs are in my code. Like turn, I guess, if you're familiar with that. Uh, no, Pilsner, I'm actually more hoping for just straight up uh, TCP port forwarding, not not using port uh, hole punching. I mean, either way, really, I don't really care what it is. Anyway, um, so as I now have rudders connected, what if you were just such an unluck unlucky guy? I'm going to go edit failures. And it's under 27 flight controls. And what if I was such an unlucky guy I just happened to be at full rudder and I got a jam? So holy crap, now my rudders are jammed and they're jammed full over, right? So I've got rudder full hard over. So in that case, what the other person needs to do is try and, you know, now they've already broken free and now they can actually just control they'd have to basically hold full right rudder such that the summing circuit is going to give me essentially zero rudder input going to be murder on your uh, on your legs but definitely better than dying i guess so that's what you'd got to do if you had a jam with a rudder hard over 
and at least, you know, breaking it apart, you get at least only half rudder. Rudder trim for assistance, obviously, yes, uh, you would try, but the rudder trim has fairly limited authority. So, even with rudder trim full over, I'm still a little bit rudder left. I still can get, you know, I, I can get some rudder in, but I'd have to hold some amount of right rudder constantly. Rudder trim cannot trim away a, a complete full rudder input all the way. To shut down the opposite engine. Um, yeah, sure. <laughs> Better than nothing. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, you better make sure you know where your buttons are. So let's reload a fresh plane here. We can go ahead and mess with it again. That's just a couple more points I wanted to make about this, and then we can go ahead and, I don't know, fly somewhere. How about it? Better than nothing. Yeah, so at failures and the last remaining bit that I add, I mean, obviously you can fail any of the nav aids here. So I go ahead and put on ship's power, uh, fire it up. And bring up, I don't know, this guy here. Bring up you, and I'm going to tune you to... Okay, already am tuned up to IPA. My other Pasqua. If you're interested, I'm on the Western US on pilot a chocolate driver. Um, not sure if I'm going to be flying PE today. But thank you for the offer. I appreciate it. Imagine a massive pilot digital 650s piling up. Cool. Um, so bearing source can go ahead and put you over, not receiving that station, am I? Uh, ah, whatever. We're going to use just the DME off. Of, oh, right now it's because I don't have alignment. There we go. So now, yep. There's bearing source. That's ADF. So what I can do is I can go ahead and kill any nav aid I want. Well, I want to kill IPA and it's a VOR. And Kablamo. But what you can still see that I'm receiving the DME off of it. So I'm receiving two miles, but I'm I'm not able to get the a radial off of off of it. Alternatively. I can go ahead and just kill the DME part. Or I can kill both IPA, VOR, and trigger. This kills it completely. And you can punch in any navate in here that you want. I can also kill the NDB. That is behind me. So currently, there is an NDB station right behind the aircraft here. This thing here. That there is an NDB antenna. <clears throat> yeah, what is your identifier? R for Romeo. Very descriptive. And go ahead and kill you. Been dead for years now. That NDB? Really? I think according to the charts, it's still there. Uh, let's see, approach. Nope, it's still there. Oh, yeah, just in general, yeah, NDBs are. He's dead, Jim. Let me actually turn on some lights here. It's getting a little bit dark in, in my office. Cool. This is where things get really interesting. It's procedural trainer. Here, have a loss of log or GS signals on approach. Yes, sir. It's possible to, but are you able to fail navigates automatically based on no TAMs? Jacob Singer, not yet. 
Um, I might add that capability. That'll be interesting for sure. Theoretically, I could. There's some ways to do it, yeah. So yeah, pneumatic stuff. Lights. Grave just could read no towns and disable all stuff navies nearby. I yeah, CBD systems. I, I I've been thinking about making this uh, capable of killing the GPS when there's a GPS jamming no tam out. That's a thing that can happen. Oh, one more or a couple more things that I wanted to talk about. Um, here are all the trigger conditions that are available for you. Some of them are similar to X-Plane and some of them, there's a lot more though. So we can trigger a condition, a, a fault based on reaching airspeed, based on the wave. Yep. Um, these are special to the airplane. So these, what they let you design is you can design um, faults at basically symbolic speeds. So whatever the FMS has programmed or the EFS has programmed as V1, VRV2, or VT, V target, um, you can fail or relative to that, like 10 knots before, five knots after, that kind of stuff. Um, then you can fail at a given altitude, at a height above ground, at a distance from a given waypoint. That's a thing that is different. So you could punch in like, I don't know, fail at when we reach five miles from the airport here. And it automatically counts down for me as well. So this will, you had this out on like an instructor station, you could see how many miles were remaining for this false to trigger. Um, then we also have things like at exact time interval, at mean time interval. This is another one of those symbolic ones at liftoff plus time interval. So I can make it happen at exactly the moment your wheels leave the ground, or I can make it happen six seconds after you leave the ground or half a minute after you leave the ground. And it'll also again, count down. As soon as I lift off, this will say how many seconds are to go to the fault triggering on selecting gear up, gear down or changing gear configuration. And then of course, manual trigger with control F or whatever you have bound to the command to trigger faults. And of course, you can directly set the thing up. We're going to show an engine out uh, at V1. Mm, we can, I, I suppose. I don't have rudder pedals currently tied up into the sim, but I can use a twist grip, I guess. One of the things about a heavy challenger is you absolutely have to put in rudder. Otherwise, you roll over unceremoniously and dismantle the aircraft in about 20 seconds. Now, why did I put in like these symbolic values? So V1, VR, V2, VT and lift off instead of let's say, you know, uh, when you reach a given altitude or when you reach a given speed level, cause you know your speed that your V1 is programmed in, right? The reason is these two buttons here, I can program a scenario say at V1 plus five, I want, you know, I don't know, left nose landing light fail. It wouldn't really matter, but that's the thing you could do. And then what you can do is you can go ahead and save this. Uh, left nose landing light fail at uh, lift off plus five. And save. And these files you can actually distribute. So if I go in like so, and I get rid of you, come up here. They are available for distribution for to anybody you want. So failure scenarios, and there you go. And if you really, really wanted to know, it's just a text file inside. Um, you could theoretically edit it, but I really wouldn't recommend it because you can you can introduce a broken format if you if you're not careful about what you're doing. That's the button I wanted to push. Good. And so then somebody else can go in and say, oh, I want to load in a scenario. Oh, that's the one. Left nose landing, I failed at lift off plus five. That's when it was created. Go ahead and load it up. So even if I say, for instance, I clear all faults here so you can see that it actually um, tr it is no longer, you know, armed. I go ahead and load that in. Now it's yellow and I'm ready to go. 
something something data and everything. Will Bombardier be able to simulate your aircraft in the future? Like Sammy 83. <laughs> Maybe. Then Graham needs to have his failures triggerable via Hoppy. Yes, that's that's also a possibility. <laughs> well not yet, but I'll see about that. So yeah, you could. And by the way, if you, you can see that this is it is a truckload of things in here, and so you know how would you know? Uh, how would you know when uh, what what you've got set up? If you just open up this window, you can get kind of lost. So I've put in a filter. I've put in a filter so you can either show only the ones that are triggered, or only ones that are armed, or both armed and triggered. So you can quickly list through any categories. They're a random failure mode. RJB4000, not yet. Um, our pilots have expressed interest in seeing a failure mode that basically is give me something random, but manually triggered. But there is currently no random by itself. That, that will not happen all by itself. So you basically have to set this up. Roll 20 sided die and see what happens. Yeah, uh, I don't want to put in just, you know, randomly stuff failing a la explains, um, a la explains, uh, you know, mean time between failure and just, you know, shit happens randomly. I, I don't want that. In fact, I should put in another button here that says clear all armed and clear all triggered. Yeah, I'm going to put so a button over here. It says clear all triggered and then clear all armed. Yeah, MTBF, that that crap. I don't like that. I mean, there's some value in, in having fun with it, but it's definitely not conducive to a training environment. Because in a training environment, uh, you want things to be predictable. Possible to have failures based on service. Service. Here's a stat statistic on um, what fails most on a real CL650. Hey, Woozleman, welcome, welcome. You haven't been around here in a long time, if I remember right. Is it possible that failure is based on service? Service of what? Rack channel. Oh, yeah, you mean servicing status, like failure due to stuff being weared, worn out. Now, that's currently not in there yet. I'm thinking about putting in some of that. Uh, right, based on flying hours. Um, I'm sort of mulling over whether to do that. The, it wouldn't really make sense to have it similar to how the TBM has it, because you're not a owner operator on this aircraft. You don't own the aircraft and you don't, you know, maintain the aircraft yourself. Um, on a Challenger, you would have, this would be, you know, usually owned by a holding company. They'd have a maintenance department or maintenance uh, contracts and you'd just be the pilots flying it, contracted and to fly the thing. So would it make sense? Probably not. Uh, I'm gonna have some of them though, for stuff like overheating the engines and, um, you know, basically just damaging the aircraft by how you fly. I do wanna put those in and those are gonna be persistent. Hydraulics. Hydraulic leaks are fun. And all of a sudden, that was a fun one where I had like a triple hydraulic failure. Let's try that one. That one was fun. In fact, let me go and put this into full screen mode. And switch this over. That's the screen. Uh, not quite. That's the screen. Yeah, there we go. Good. So get rid of this, that, everything. And you do your fire tests and everything and all that good stuff. I got to move that HUD to you now be with the correctly aligned, uh, See seating position about like what do I like? Yeah, this is what I like for the seating position. 
Now the yoke's kind of in the way, which is real. So we got to put in a hide button or hide function for the yoke. Alrighty. Give me a ding. Ding. You don't have to wait for that lamp to come or the ding to come on. You can put it the APU generator immediately on as soon as you get that green avail light. And you would wait two minutes before putting on the APU bleed, but I don't care. So we've got the APU starter going. Now, what did I want to do here? I'm gonna put my keyboard up out of the way so I get a little bit more leverage here. It's gonna be somewhat con contorted flying position, but you know, it's something we'll, we'll make it happen. Good. Get the other engine up. You start your timer and everything, all that good stuff. I can show you what a hung start looks like. Hang on. Just gonna kill the engine here again. Get the ITT back down. Really, the engine's cool enough. It's just the probe at this point is is a little bit sluggish to respond. Cool. Kill the starter. Reset that. We're gonna do a hung start. So. Engine starting. Make a left engine hung start. And yeah, you can well sort of. Cool. So we've given the starter enough time to cool off. Do a start initiation. So far everything is looking normal. This is you know how you you would recognize the idea so that you would not be able to easily like recognize that the engine is going to be hung up. Put the fuel in. But it ain't really doing much, is it? It's just kind of lazily sitting there. At this point, you would, you know, look at your timer, think, okay, you know, we've been sitting here for a half minute trying to get it to start anything going nowhere, so we're done. We're start. Attempt and you would obviously wait for your full 90 seconds, get it as cool as possible. All that good stuff. I forgot to start my timer. Apologies for that. Cool. Starter off. So we'll get this cleared out of here. Okay, starter up again. Now with an actual timer. All right, uh, Graham, you wanted, you were asking about the aileron mono K, what that is. 
That is for detecting if you have a ECU jam. So. There are dual PCUs for each of the ailerons, obviously. Um, and for those not in the know, PCU means uh, power control unit. That's basically your hydraulic actuator plus controls, hydraulic control circuit. Um, we we'll add these on. Yes, Gen 1 and 2. 14 stage, keto heats, all of that. Yeah, close enough. And also stabilizer trim. And come back one notch. Good stuff. So if you have an aileron PCU jam, then what it does is it detects if there is, it's a little bit complicated to explain, but basically if, if the, let me show you, can I actually do that without failing the flight? Let me think. It's under 29 hydraulics. No, hang on, it's 27 flight controls. Aileron, yeah, this one's a fun one. You're gonna reverse the control cable inputs. So I'm putting in left and you can see both ailerons are going down and up. And similarly on the elevators, I can do that <laughs> and on the rudder if you reverse the inputs all it does is it basically just gives null input you can see the rudder is just sort of jittering in place even though i'm giving it full rudder just because of the summing function when you've got opposite cables in there uh, then they basically sum to nothing so you know, I can also kill the rudder input so that it would look like so now even though I have both rudders linked you can see both sets of rudder pedals moving down there left rudder right rudder you can see we're only going to have deflection so this is where you would this is about making sure that you do your flight control check correctly so when you give it rudder it's not just you know oh, it's something's moving there close enough you got to check to make sure that it goes all the way doesn't just go part of the way, it goes all the way. And also that the sense of the flight controls is correct. When I'm given left yoke, left uh, aileron goes up, right goes down, and the opposite way around. As if you had some lovely rigging on the control cables, you can end up with opposite aileron input. Now, if I put in left aileron, I would actually roll right. Make sure your flight controls are correct. Um, PCU jam. If I do a PCU jam, actually, so that would cause one of the PCUs to actually disconnect. So that's not something I'm going to do yet. I'm going to show that later. But with aileron mono K um, uh, reflector reality sim does is that it checks that the detection circuit for the aileron for the PCU jamming system is. Um, good, and it's only on the ailerons, not on the elevators. Cool. Let's punch in some V-speeds. Uh, yes, I have no flight plan, I know. Um, I'm going to say that it's 21 degrees outside, because I know that that is the case. I'm going to pull the fuel quantity out of the FMS. And I'm going to go to takeoff. I am at 100 feet pressure elevation. Pressure altitude. All I need, and I'm gonna send the beast beats here to the EFIS, good stuff, rock and roll. I'm just gonna set the value up here, to like 200. I'm just looking at the at, at the pre-select for the speed. And I got 5,000 feet. I'm gonna push toga here, give me takeoff, takeoff. And it also gives me a fly up flight director. Also, arms N1TO mode on the ATS. So, Ellinger, clear the chocks. Clear the external power. Go away, everybody. We have takeoff config OK. Give it, I didn't want to push you. 
Gonna give it a little bit more nose up, trim, and let's go. I could do a run up. Oh, right, this nose wheel steering is helpful. Whoa. ATS. Okay, looking for 91.2. And we'll hold 90.8, close enough. There's V1, and rotate. Good stuff, get the autopilot out. We thought about including a feature similar to the exact wire you can do, enable to disable ground equipment through radio intercom rather than using a menu. Huh, they're gonna be much better than that. This is just a placeholder. Here you go, huh? I'm gonna have a different system for that. Alrighty, thousand feet is far gone, so you're above target speed, accelerating. I'm going to set it up to two, 210. Go to climb speed constraint. And I'm going to go ahead and kill the APU. So get the APU transition. If, huh, hopefully I remember this right. So it's like that and that. And like that and that. Have the to go. Altitude select cap, good stuff. Heading hold. And the ATS is in speed mode, so it's pulling back on the power. Good stuff. So, have some fun with some failures. We're gonna go to hydraulics. And you are going to leak out. Let's say you're going to leak out in two minutes. And you are going to leak out in about one minute. And system two is going to leak out in about three minutes. So if I bring up my hydraulic synoptic display here. Hey, Baguera, how are you? Getting ready to get that build for you ready, man. Just finalizing some stuff. So system three is, is gone. Pressure is going down. Pump is starting to have trouble pulling oil out of there. Make it like spray red red oil out of there, huh? Now system one's gone. Pretty soon the cautions are gonna start coming up. Now since I'm not putting any flight control demands on this thing. I still, you know, I'm not having any trouble with uh, anything yet. Since I'm not actually, you know, controlling the aircraft, it's, the flight controls are just sitting there. Hydraulic low pressure. We'll have a QRH for the. Well, we have a QRH for these failures. I'm not sure, big where. I would basically have to be reproducing the entire QRH of the real thing, which, uh, yeah, I'm not too keen on spending another three months writing a QRH. We'll see. So now we are on single hydraulics. But the airplane is still controllable, so if I kill the autopilot, still, but you can see we're dropping pressure really fast because I'm starting to use the flight controls. 
And in fact, pretty soon. It's starting to get somewhat sluggish because now, yeah, so see, I've got, I'm putting a truckload of aileron input in there. But if I bring it up to flight control synoptic, you'll notice that now only the right side, right elevator rudder still works because that one's tied to all three systems. There's nowhere model implemented right now. You just randomize. Randomize. What do I randomize? Randomize the values for the engine parameters on load. Um, no. So Kurigahan currently, I no. The engine for well, there's some randomization. The individual side to side variances are slightly randomized because of the fact that you know engines are manufactured with different tolerances. Um, eventually, these are going to be persisted. So, here we go. Fun times ahead. So, now System 3 is starting to have trouble. I guess I misinterpreted what you were saying about the maintenance month earlier. Um, no, so I will eventually have persistent everything, but and not in terms of, you know, where over time. It's not such a trivial thing to do with a big jet. Now we got hydraulic too low pressure. Now we're really up shit creek without a paddle. And if I don't move the flight controls very much, I can still sort of, you know, if I'm very, very careful, show you on the yoke here. I'm very careful in how I control the airplane. I can try and stretch the hydraulic pressure that is still inside of the system. Cause there's a, there's a hydraulic pressure ac accumulator on the number two, one, 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 two, and three system. They're essentially sort of like a hydraulic battery. <clears throat> but any time you make an, a flight control input, you basically demand fluid out of that accumulator. And since we have a leak in the tank, any fluid that gets pulled out of the accumulator goes through the flight control and goes back into the tank, just leaks out the airplane. It was no longer available to pressurize. Therefore, the hydraulic accumulator no longer gets any extra energy input. Now we got aileron mod okay because we lost all hydraulic power, or because it thinks that we're sub 800 psi on all three systems. I might only show on the ground. I'll need to check that. I still can kind of control the aircraft a little bit, as long as I'm very careful. If I put in a large flight control input. It's not too bad yet. I have an entire model where it tries to, uh, there we go. So now we're pretty much, you know, gone. Oh, uh, there we still can, uh, okay, we're out of, we can go into the lower state and yeah. And I have no rudder. So what do we do now? We go ahead and kill ATS immediately. And do an asymmetrical thrust thing. Get rid of you. <clears throat> okay. I'm instinctively pushing on the yoke here, but this is getting pretty spicy. So, we're done. This thing no longer does anything. These things no longer do anything. So what do we do? Now, we're in flying like a Zeppelin. It's about the amount of sophistication that our flight model is going to have at this point. No shade, obviously. But, yeah, we're at this point. We can go by thrust, so I can add thrust. That's going to push us up as we accelerate. It's a little bit complicated because of the fact that there's reverse coupling on the thrust here. So if I, for example, if you know on, a, on something like a 737, you add power and immediately it brings your nose up. It doesn't happen on the Challenger quite that way. You, you actually need to accelerate the Challenger to get the trim to be more effective. But if you, for example, initially chop power here, so I'm going to pull back, fully on idle, the nose actually would have a slight tendency to come up. If I do the reverse, you can actually see that quite well at that low speed. 
I go ahead and put in a truckload of power. You can see it actually pushes my nose very far down. And only as I accelerate, it's actually going to start pulling up out of the trim because of the trim speed. <clears throat> so I've got to keep a little bit of asymmetric thrust because I have some asymmetry in lift, apparently maybe by weight in order to be able to like roll. And I'm using trim here, so elevator trim to actually control the pitch of the nose. Are we going to be able to actually extend the landing gear? I'm not entirely sure. So for funsies, uh, let's go ahead. I am on that side of the thing. Which side of the island am I on? Okay. Um, so, flight plan. Got to stabilize this thing. Uh, this is where a first officer would be very helpful uh, for the time being. Let's just go SCIP, enter. I'm going to go arrive. Runway. Visual runway 28, five mile extension. I'm gonna give myself a nine mile extension. Execute. And I'm gonna go direct to there. Okay, close enough. What the hell's it doing? Stupid thing here. Okay, so I'm going to go ahead and try a setup for a landing. So I've got full idle on the left, power up on the right. And this is going to be dicey. I've done this a couple of times. Um, it's very difficult. It controls like a, like I said, like a steamboat about the sophistication of the handling at this point. Okay, let's give ourselves laps 20. Push the trim down fast. Counter. 2500. A little bit low, so I'm going to get the power back up. Figure out a couple of major understanding. Yeah. Okay. We are below gear extension speed, and this I'm now I'm just differential thrust using control the roll rate. Good stuff. Okay. So will the gear extend actually? It will, because there are down lock, down lock actuators, but we're not going to get the nose door to close. That needs hydraulic power. Yes. 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 Nose door. It's a little bit pissed off there, but that's fine. It flaps 30 in. And I want to stabilize as soon as possible. Still fairly far away, 8 miles from the runway. Keep the speed stable. Arm thrust reversers. HUD really helps here if I don't have to try and interpret it off of the uh, synthetic vision down there or off of the PFD. The cockpit has now been some pretty texturing. Yes, sir. Uh, kind of unsettled it a little bit. Because I don't have uh, hydraulic pressure on the rudder, I don't have a yaw damper, so the aircraft tends to have a little bit of a, uh, you know, lazy a, a Dutch aids or you know, Dutch roll tendency. So I've got to be very careful. Or I got to carefully consider. Actually, I'm a little bit off the left here, so we want to roll left and then roll right. There we go. So here's our glide path. back all the way to final approach speed 
Because I don't know what it is. I currently I didn't check, but probably gonna be around 140, give or take. So, yeah, flaps 45 out. That's gonna give me a three degree marker on the HUD. Good. And just using trim here. And like I said, it maneuvers about as well as a boat. I'm gonna keep the speed up, but side to side synchronicity the engines I'm using to roll. Ugh. Hopefully you guys are not, you know, requesting 30,000 things off of me in chat because I'm a bit busy. i not to die here. It doesn't have to be the most stable approach, it just has to be a serviceable one. I need to take the roll right out of there. You have to basically anticipate every move with about, you know, five second lead or give or take. Going too fast. Basically just trying to place the flight path vector on the runway. There we go. Doesn't have to be neat. Doesn't have to be in the touchdown zone. It just has to be survivable. Probably gonna get a rate. Sink rate. There we go. Sink rate. 50, 40, 30, 20. That was too much. 10. There we go. No current checklist to restart. What the hell are you talking about? Yeah. Whoa, man, what the hell did you do? I want reverse. Ah, yeah, sure. Uh, we could use brakes here as well. Nose wheel steering is operative, by the way. because nose wheel steering goes off of the uh, brake system accumulators which are coming off of uh, the these two systems or is it only the inboard brakes but that means that if I steer with the nose wheel so I'm gonna you know here's the steering tiller I steer with the nose wheel I'm gonna deplete the accumulators so I have to steer very carefully with the nose wheel but you can see we're we're alive and in one piece and since we have the nose door open here that's simply because of the fact that i have no hydraulic pressure um and if i go and clear the faults What up with reverse with pneumatics? Yes, 14th stage error. Okay, faults are cleared. We can go in here and can retract flaps a couple of notches. Give myself that uh, trim is about good. Rust reverser are looking good. 21C, we got the takeoff thrust limit set. So it breaks off. I'm gonna now engine out at VR. I'm sure. Let's go ahead and swing around. Stand by. Cool. Rock and roll. Four thousand psi. Did it momentarily hit 4,000 psi? It might have as the, uh, the the pumps might have overregulated a little bit. This is really not sort of a condition I checked too hard. 
Anyway, um, engine out at VR. Which engine? Which side would you guys prefer? Left or right? I don't care. They're both equally good to me. Right side. Okay, right. And engine out in what fashion? Do we want to seize up the rotor? Do we want to just um, fail the fuel control? Do we want to just have a flame out, momentary flame out, persistent flame out? We'd have a transient flame out in a critical engine, right? Correct. Yeah, there is none. We can have a transient engine flame out. And I want to trigger at VR. Exactly VR. And offset zero or offset nothing it means if I go to perf, I got to load up the perf values here. Uh, takeoff, send, and as soon as I send them over, there we are. My well, hydraulics is pretty bad. Okie doke, let's go. So, Oga, brakes off. I forgot the brakes off. Yes, I do. Let's go. Not very heavy, so it's not really going to be all that spicy. V1, rotate. Oh, there it is. Does need a lot of rudder. Ah, not very good, am I? <laughs> and for a bit of a fly. Hmm, only the right side says stall. Left side says also stall. What's your problem? Not that spicy. Okay, apparently I screwed up. Now what the hell are you doing? Start. Famous last words. <laughs> yeah. Come on, don't fall backwards, stupid thing. There are all kinds of bound up and stuff. Yes. And I want the chocks in. Yeah, okay. Trying to see you crashing. Yeah, funny, huh? Um, what was the issue there? We had enough thrust. I gotta clean off my desk here. It's all kinds of shit in place. Yep, yep, yep. Everything will get you up and running in a sec. Good stuff. Not that. That, that, that. Okay. Go. That decent. Do the same exercise. Oh, neat. Um, cool. OAT 21. Grab the current tankage state, take off. 
this 100 feet above sea level. Give me the takeoff speeds there. And that. Takeoff is set. Good. Let's go. Run a quick one. Get rid of it. I'm going to bother with this thing. I forgot to program the failure in, so go to engine. The hell? Hit a bug. What is your problem? Did it not? Malik error. Who put that there? Don't show this again and piss off already, I explain. Blanc Lirio channel. I hope not. Your shocks are away, you go away. And ATC and let's go. The failure is still perfect. No, it isn't. You know, something's fucked when I reload the airplane, it goes. So we want to go engine, do a transient flame out. At, no, not there. At VR. Good stuff. I think I know why. That's, I'm really not used to this stupid thing with the twist grip and everything. But you do need to pour in all the... I, mean, I put the wrong side in. Uh, here... Not that, I want the right side to have a transient flame out at VR. Good. Okay, rotate. Okay. Got full cross controls on. Uh, so the problem is I pulled up too hard. Well, that mountain ain't help, helping anything. Okay, let's do it again. Ah, oh, come on, I explain, you stupid piece of shit. Clear all. Actually, well, that's already cleared up. Oh, wrong side. The hell? I said start. Oh, yeah. Probably help if we put some ignition in there. the hot indication there disregard that okay right side yeah flame out at VR and I have to resend the 
speeds. Speeds are sent. And one and two off. Those are now online. Good. Let's go. I wonder if I'm going to have to break out the rudder pedals for this. Stupid thing I did with my throttles here. Let's see. I don't want this on so the transient flame out actually happens. Um, transient flame out at VR. Only VR cut is pretty damn hard without pedals. Must this all the time. It's the first time seeing this plane. Is it close to release? Uh, close enough, Bubba, yeah, close enough. Um, soon, I guess. Let's see. It breaks off. It breaks off, actually. Yes, they are. Good. Good, now ATS on. APR is armed. Actually, it might be more difficult if I'm if I'm light. The extra boom that the engines have. Having to basically pull almost full rudder in. There we go. Yeah, it's the stupid twist grip. I have to push in full right rudder or left rudder, and I must not over over alpha the thing because then I basically run out of rudder authority and aileron authority. But yeah, if I'm just me being unused to having to use twist grip and everything. And the reason why both engines went back before is because when the ATS disconnects and you're on the ground and you have both throttles at idle things that you have, you have both physical throttles at things that you actually want to stop. So get rid of this. But yeah, now it is much better. I had proper rudders, it wouldn't have happened the first time around. Yeah. And that's the thing, is with twist grip, you have to, like, do something that's fairly unnatural. Right, there we go. 700 feet a minute, climb rate. There's a thousand feet. We could accelerate now. Okay, there's VT, we're waiting for VT plus 5 and accelerating, so now we can go flaps up. That should help with the speed. Okay, and starting to become a lot more controllable. And I'd have to, you know, if I had two hands available and my mouse is over on the wrong side, I'd have to go ahead and shove in all the right rudder trim. The left rudder trim, actually. Is it all in? It is. Good. Okay, now I'm 
basically just pushing a little bit of left rudder. I can't trim away the complete forces, but uh, most of it, actually I can, if I just lower the nose and get enough speed, then I can just hold it with aileron. It's uh, left engine is still in APR mode, so it's basically giving it all it's got. Around planet production version, coming along nicely. Have a rest of you, great rest of your day, Beguero, as well. Be around. Okay. If I pull power now out of the climb, it's actually gonna be just perfect for the amount of rudder I've got in, the rudder trim. Okay, there we go. So, lesson learned. Install rudder pedals, I guess. Um, so, uh, I'm going to pause it here. I'm going to go to the bathroom and give ourselves a five minute break. And I'm going to install some rudder pedals. And uh, I'll talk to you in five minutes. We're going to do it again with rudder pedals this time with a lot less spice. So, five minutes, folks.
buddy. Alrighty. Back at it. Um, fortunately, couldn't find the cable to hook up my pedals, so... Pedals are not going to happen this stream anyway. So, anyway, let's see. What, what can we mess with? Something different we can mess with. Well, first of all, I want to mess with this is fixing some bugs. So there was a issue in here. Or if I reposition the aircraft after opening the failures manager. So that one there. Let's go like this. Graphics, Windows Simulator. Okay, so if I reposition the aircraft, go back to wherever. Yep. All right. Get the gear chocks in place. And now if I open the failure... Hmm. Would it have to have been open while I repositioned it? Let's try that. Now... What the hell? Why did it crash before and not again? Now, this is annoying. Well, great. Can't figure out why it crashed before. There's some sort of a malcorruption, even though it didn't occur in many of my code. It could have been something I'll probably did, something I did. Ah, I hate that. Oh, well. Anyway, get back to coding. Uh, actually, I want to get rid of this data output here for speeds. I want to bring up the one for frame rates. Close enough. And there were bugs I had lined up. So get ground equipment, AC generator. I hate to think about how many lost flight hours of fun I have due to all the time spent coding. <laughs> I don't have many flight hours for fun, so that takes care of that for me. Cool. So the problem is in here when I go into the uh, wing test. No, not that one. It's the duct monitor test, yes. There should be an anti ice duct. Air duct. Okay, so that is over in here. I already had the file open. So where's the anti-ice duct message? There you are. So that is a warning message. Bring you down. Do, 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 do. It's the air data system. IPS. There we go. Ice protection system. Cool. Right wing anti-ice. Left wing anti-ice. Right cow anti ice ice detector. That's in duct. Oh, where are you? Is that part of the pneumatic? No. Hmm. Uh, it's so let's go. Comp DCU channel, no, DCU cast triggers, uh, 29 pneumatic, no, it's hydraulic, which one's pneumatic, 20 just fuel, 27 flight controls, 26 fire protection, um, 32 is landing gear, 31 is indicating a recording, 
21 is pneumatic. Yes. Or no, that's air conditioning. Mod existing as a UL plane style fighter artist and team up. That's just Bruce. I'm getting caught up. Cool, yeah. Um, will be a good plane of project. Start as a program without 3D artist. 3D modeler. Ooh, good question. I'm not sure. It's 30. It's the ice and rain protection. Keep skipping over that one. Man, I'm already there. Okay, 14th. We're in 36. Okay. So 36, what are you? Yes, you are pneumatic here. So what are your ducts? Oh, there's going to be a truckload of those, huh? Ah, actually, I can abstract that. Channel be common. Duct fail. So 10th stage duct fail. Duct 14th fail condition 0 and 1. Okay, so in the description of that, waiting for a Zebo. And let me check my documentation here. These modded planes be open source. Seems very hard to maximize community talent if they aren't open source. Yeah, it's a bit weird if they aren't if they're not, huh? Get rid of this. Get rid of this. Good. Uh, Anti-ice duct. One of the conditions that follow is true. Left fuselage duct fail. Left wing fail. Left fuselage, right fuselage duct fail. Right wing fail. Hmm. Can't be well managed projects. Cool. So when we've got. Bleed air duct. And we've got either one of these. Duct fail. Bleed air duct. Or no, hang on. That's for a different set of conditions. Wing duct, pylon duct. Yeah, BLDU. Yeah, bleed lead detection unit. Yeah, that's the one we want. So. Channel A, do you digitize this data for me? Yes, BLDU, wing duct fail, pylon duct fail. So what is the set of conditions there anyway? Duct 14th, fail. Okay, so it's for these. So wing or pylon duct. I think it's bad. No. That's only for the wing and fuselage and, and yeah, I don't have a fuselage. No, I do have a fuselage duct. Okay, so they, these two are what triggers the message that I am missing. Okay, so cast triggers for 30 anti-ice duct. Yes, okay, okay, okay. Are we gonna leave you in here? Where are you supposed to be? You're looking cast listing. We are looking for section 30. Huh, yeah, I guess. Little ice, window, wing stuff. Yeah, I'm gonna put you in here. We're just adding the cast message here that was missing. So cast, anti-ice duct, it's a warning type message. I'm gonna give you a delay of zero. And your trigger conditions are this. So we got BLDU. BLDU zero fuselage duct or BLDU one leak leak detection unit that'll be the right hand side is there actually 
ELDU. Yeah, it would be nice if, if Laminar had some explicit explicit info on that. It's hard to be sure though. ECU channel A. Okay, yeah, they, they are two different sets of bleed leak monitors, so that means we need to check both sides. And one second time delay on. Sure. I guess I could just do it over like that. Simplify the expression a little bit. There we go. Anti-ice duct is when we trigger that one. Good stuff. Go into the sim, reload. Are there any 100% open source planes in X planes? Bank? I'm not entirely sure. I don't generally bother with looking at stuff like that, so you guys tell me. Anti ice duct. Huh. Anti ice duct. Now it's keeping keeps on saying that one, which is a bit annoying because it shouldn't be. Uh, bleed air duct has a higher priority. How do I prioritize this thing? So it keeps on saying that. I think I know. No, do I? Yeah, I might need to just go ahead and stick you into right 10th duck, 14th cast list. Lead air duct. Yeah, it's it's a current over here. So what if I just took you out of there and stuck you in after it? The order in here might solve my issue. Might. Might not. I had to get, had to go at fix and replacing the brain plug in my airbus when screens are getting dirty. There we go. Bleed air duct. Okay. And these are a lower priority than bleed air duct than the bleed air duct oral. So list later. Listed later. Okay. Yeah, close enough. Good. Because I know that when you do the duct test, right, Pelznerish, and you do the duct monitor test, then it only says bleed air duct. Alrighty. Bleed air duct. Bleed air duct. Hang on, I'm gonna change one of these things here. The triggers underscore underscore thirty delay zero. So that one's gonna appear as soon as the other one that some messages appear. Or no, hang on. It occur actually faster than the other ones. I'll see. Bleed air duct. Okay, now that now is occurring too quickly. Bleed air duct. Okay, poor thing's getting a little bit confused there, so we'll take care of that. Did I do that test in the plane? I forget. Uh, probably, I think you did. Yeah, yeah. So 
Something tells me like you did. Yeah, loop A test, loop B test, okay. Good stuff. How loud is it for you guys? Fairly loud. Bleed air duct. Good. Bleed air duct. It says it's about, Bleed well, it should be about duct. 10 dB quieter than me. So I'm the star of the show, so I'm the one who's going to be heard. Good. So taking care of that. So we can go ahead and uh, where are you? Testing leader, following cast anti ice duck appears. Load of four red cast message associated with green duck test. Okay. Ah, oh, I forgot another one. Cast list. Oh, yeah, duck test. Okay. Forgot you. Why did I forget you? Mm, F grep, F grep, duck test okay. Yeah, I forgot you as well. So cast triggers 30. And you are listed as being part of which category? You're in section 36. So that one's going to go over into 36. Cast. Duck test okay. You are an advisory. Delay one. And when do you trigger? 10 dB is good differential. Good to know. Um, 10 to 15 dBs is a, is a pretty good differential. That means it's detectably quieter, but it's not too quiet. Okay. Because all the conditions that follow are true. Oh, that's going to be a long list there. <laughs> Stand by. Well, let me show you. So. We have. I'm just going to copy that blurb of text in here. So I got some references for that. Boop. So all the following conditions are follow are true okay so it's going to be coming over cross talk bus cross talk bus um then it's bleed league detection unit zero and which label are you BLDU, blah, 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 unit test. BLDU zero unit test. Or BLDU one is in unit test. Then, rather, both of them have to be in test. So that and that actually sanitize in case it's not sending out any data. Good. Left fuselage duct fails. So bleed leak unit zero, blah, blah, blah. Wing fuse, fuse duct. Sanitize. Number one. Uh, left fuselage duct, fuse duct. Sanitize and BLDU zero. Uh, manifold duct, so man duct. Man duct. We start we just start combining these together. So and I'm putting these in between. Actually not here. Here. And and okay, so manifold duct. Pylon duct. Not man duct duct, just man duct. Pylon duct. 
and wing duct fail okay we've got all these signals and that should be it reload Did i make a mistake anywhere i didn't at least not in formatting whether it's going to actually do anything let's see <laughs> I need to fix something in those conditions. Bleed air. Duck. Okay, you didn't quite do what I wanted you to, so what is your problem? We expect all of these to work. So, Mr. BLDU, zero. What are your set of states? All of these are true. Bleed air. Manifold duct, duct pilot duct, unit Bleed test wing duct, duct, and fuse duct. Bleed air duct. Bleed air duct. Okay, is that data being serialized correctly? ECU X. And you are label ID 100. Label ID is 100 BLDU. Okay, so. These are all 111111. air. Got unit test. Bleed we got air. fuse duct, duct, fuse duct, man Bleed duct, man air. duct, pylon duct, pylon duct, Bleed air. and duct. wing duct, wing duct, are both air. one. Duct. Uh, it jumps around because it's just whenever it happens to be evaluated true. Yes. Bleed air duct. Just there's. Yes, there is some randomness and unpredictability Bleed in air, the order of when the signals arrive and, and all that stuff. You're looking for them being there, not being in exactly the same order every time. Wing duct, wing duct, pylon duct, pylon duct, man duct, man duct. <clears throat> so all these should be true. True, bleed true, air, duct. true, bleed true, air, duct. unit test, that, air, duct. Ah, right, it's only, unit test is only on, on system one, so this is not a thing. Right, unit test is only on, on unit zero. Good, so, reload, now she'll take her. Can't be overridden. The tickets seem to imply a fixed order. Um, it says it appears below the four red cast, but I'm pretty sure that's pretty random. Just happens based on whenever that condition gets evaluated. Bleed air. Duck. It will always, I think. Could it occur above or below? I don't know, maybe. I could make it always appear below the 14th stage lines. The 10th stage, that is a different duct monitor system. Bleed I can make it always appear duct. below the 14th stage. Anyway, what was I looking for here? Yes, duct test, Bleed okay. Air, duct. Uh, let's see. That'll be in 30. Anti-ice duct. So if I extract you out of here and shove you in, you see you cast triggers 36. If I shove you in here.
It should appear. We think. Would it appear above or below? I'll see. Yeah, two discs blowing earlier. The reveal, or is this still a surprise waiting in the stream? I'm curious. Reveal is, I don't know. I was just Goran saying it. I'm not really sure I classified as much of any re reveal. Blued air duct. Hmm. Because of alphabetical ordering. Could be. Yeah, it could be just because of alphabetical ordering. You know, it could be. I don't know. Honestly, uh, not like we had anything great planned or anything like that. Blued air duct. Hmm. Below the four other red cast messages. It makes no sense for it to always appear at a fixed position. Because the cast system stacks messages at the Bleed top when they're air new. Duct. Bleed air duct. Let me check the source here for the ICAS. ICAS, DCU, are you? What are you doing when you've got multiple to evaluate? I think called update cast or something like that. DCU main. Handle cast. MV pairs in it. Cast is okay. Cast list. Yeah, this is the way I can make them all appear. Cast list 30. Put you back where you belong. I will always appear below those 14 things. I mean, there's a lot of this. This has never been seen before in flight. What he said. So now we'll always appear below the 14 stage lines. But if the 10th stage signal appears just a little bit before. Anti-ice duct. Bleed air duct. Bleed I think air there is duct. a way to get it to do what you wanted, what you mentioned there. ECU, can, ECU channel A, I'm gonna have to change this to essentially transmit at maximum bus rate. That way, theoretically, all the signals should appear at the same time, almost exactly. So now see what happens. So I'm gonna use and make you guys go at full bus rate. That should theoretically take care of that. Anti-ice duct or that's because I released it faster than it could uh, trigger the uh, 10th stage message. Just putting shrugs in the code now. 
Oh, I've done worse. Yeah, now the order is essentially fixed, but... I'm not sure this is how it would behave in reality, because I've seen the lamps come on at different speeds as well. Like, I've seen the lamps individually come on at different times, just a fraction of a second apart, which means, leads me to suspect that the DCU is evaluating each line individually, so to speak. Lead air duct. See how sometimes they don't all quite operate at, at the same time. Lead air duct. Anti ice duct. Yeah, it's just that it released a little bit too early. Lead air duct. I keep holding it until it starts talking. Lead air duct. Lead air duct. Hmm. Again, though, here we're essentially trying to guess at basically what the duct. implementation internally looks like. Lead air duct. Lead air duct. And we're not really concerned about making sure that we're matching you know, every single line in every exact presentation. I know, I know. Literally unflyable. And again, no, interesting why, why the cabin is at 60 degrees Celsius. We can go ahead and quickly fix that. I don't have this fully done yet, but I can at least... Oh. Gorin's kind of starting to work on the cabin there, but not quite getting there. Yeah, he hasn't lined up the interior and exterior part of the door yet. <laughs> I just wanted to cool the cabin off, so... What's the cabin conditions now? There we go. There we go. Looking better. <laughs> right, aileron mono K. Huh. Yeah, that's a... I should probably add a failure for that, for the aileron jam monitor. Um, but that does... If you're still around... Um, hang on, let me just commit this change. So I didn't change anything here. I did change stuff here. Good, good, good. Cool. So get you. Good check in. Bleed test cast missing. Sure. I reword that. Ah, close enough. Ah, crap. A doodles. Uh, get branch minus M temp. Get fetch origin. Real nice piece of mechanical engineering, but that seemed slow. Well, Pilsner stats. Debug screen will have to show up in door. <laughs> Probably. Environmental. Yeah. In here? I suppose I could, yeah. Um, it's not that slow. I know I, there's a 
just kind of working on I, I haven't really bothered doing too much work there uh origin master origin master cherry pick temp push good 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 and we're gonna tag you with build 118 close status close and we'll say it's gonna be fixed and commit that guy there okay bug fixed hopefully mostly anyway okay right cool stuff what did i want to talk about right i don't know if graham's still here um but anyway, what the aileron mod OK sa says, a uh, bit of a discussion, I guess, about the aileron monitor or aileron monitoring circuit. Um, let me see. Let me see. Do I have? Yes, there we go. Let's start drawing stuff or whatever. So, quick recap on how a PC works. Uh, the power control unit, that is essentially the hydraulic actuator system, actuation system in the aircraft. Um, let me get a tablet here going. Since I got a trillion USB ports on this thing, I can actually do that without losing any functionality. Are you a functional USB cable? Looks like it. Where's a USB port in here? Is that a USB port or is that HDMI? That's HDMI. Oh, I gotta use one of the other ones. Thanks. There we go. And the port goes in like that. Perfect. Hopefully I didn't kick myself off the line. No, I'm not. Still here. Good stuff. So, um, aileron PCU. Uh, well, it doesn't really matter what sort of... Let's make this the tail end of the aileron, right? So... This is about where the sort of curvy part of the hinge is, and then it goes out. So aileron is that away. We got a hinge, and then we got a mounting point for the PCU. PCU is essentially a hydraulic actuator that looks, well, first of all, it consists of a hydraulic actuator. I'm gonna draw the insides. Disregard all the sort of crooked lines in there. There. So like that. So a hydraulic actuator has two lines going to it. It has a line on one end. And these are combined as both return and supply lines. So they can push fluid in under pressure and they can retrieve fluid depressurized. How do we select between what it's supposed to do? Well, there's a selector valve that effectively, let me, let me think how, to, how I'm gonna draw this. Mm. Let's see, and the return would be, how would you look? Draw you like that. Yeah, sure. Um, so let's draw it as sort of like a box. It doesn't necessarily, I'm just trying to represent the principle here, not necessarily the exact thing. So there's gonna be, let's see, one way to represent a, or one way to do it would be to go it like this, and then there would be a, interlink in between them that then goes outside that would be your selector valve input 
And over here we have, we've got a pressure supply line. And notice that the pressure supply line, this is covering the port, right? So there's a pressure supply line. Probably gonna be easier if I do it just with my mouse here. So pressure supply line. So here we've got uh, fluid coming in under pressure. So this is a high pressure line. And I'm gonna make it, I don't know, uh, let's make it red, right? So this is the highly pressurized side of the system or also known as the supply, system, supply line or supply side. Um, this is pressurized by your pumps. That's the that's where the accumulator sits and all of this sort of good stuff. And then we've also got a uh, then we've also got in here we've got a return, and that's going to bypass this part. Anybody interested in this, or or am I just basically? Boring everybody to sleep here. I said eraser. The hell? Oh right, I don't have a alpha layer back there, so I don't know. Oh, give me a background color. There. Like that. Um and this would be your I uh, won't quite work. Hang on. Learn anything aviation related. Oh. Hang on. We'd have to put you like so. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I know. I've got it slightly badly drawn here, uh, but we'll make it work. This would be more like so. of this and I'll fill you up so this is all still sort of filled in with junk yep 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 and we'll extend you out here as well this is all filled up right this is all solid in here so to speak um and the hydraulic lines that go to the end this stuff is while we're here ah cool <laughs> Glad you are. Um, so the actuators, they go sort of, let's just say they hook up right past this part and they hook up like, yeah, hang on, I'm, I'm drawing. Now that, that goes like so, like that. And on the other side, it does basically the same thing, but hooks up to the other side. So it goes like so and so. And this part here is also open, also open. So notice, and I'm gonna, oops, what, here, good stuff. And this side here is low pressure. So I'm gonna use, I don't know, hope everybody can see the blue, color blue as opposed to red. So this would be your low pressure side of the system. Um, and that goes out of the actuator. So this would be low pressure, also known as the return that goes to your hydraulic reservoir. Do I have good high pressure also known as the supply. So the way you control this is by essentially just moving this input here 
to be your input linkage to the actuator. Now, we're just basically just talking about the, the selector valve and the, the actuator. Say for instance, I move the actuator or the selector this way. So what I'm doing here is, is what I'm gonna be doing is I'm gonna be uncovering this port and I'm gonna be all red. So when, I, when this whole thing, when this set of selector plates moves this way, I'm going to open up this port to allow it to go in here. So now I'm supplying pressure on this side. And at the same time, I'm allowing, as this part here goes that way, I'm allowing fluid to transfer out of here into the low pressure return. So at that point, what would happen is I would get high pressure here, low pressure here, and the actuator, the entire thing would move that way, right? So I would be in inputting an, in an up selection input. The reverse obviously happens in the other direction. So if I uh, move the selector valve the other way, I'd get high pressure flowing in around here into this port. And then I'd be dumping pressure out of here into the dump port or the return port. Now the trick why this is called, a, this is just basic hydraulic actuator stuff. What makes this a PCU, really the, the trick here, is how this is rigged up to your um, to the to the flight controls, or rigged up to to a feedback. So, if this was directly linked up to your yoke, as soon as you move the yoke sort of out of center, it would start moving and just keep on moving because this would control the rate of extension, right? How much how much this is displaced in either direction control the rate of flow because these ports are partially coverable. They don't necessarily uncover completely, only a little bit, and that will cause them to, you know, start flowing fluid in there and pressing the flight control in, a direct, in the desired direction. If we just linked up your, your yoke input, if we just took your yoke input and directly linked it up to this, then your yoke input would control the rate of deflection of the flight controls, but that's not what we want. What we want is absolute position so that when you move the yoke a certain position, the flight control will move to that position and stay there, not move. So instead, what we do is we get this part, we keep it, we keep going through with it, basically go all the way through the, the actuator. Now this is closed off obviously, so it won't leak fluid out of there. We create another linkage here. And then what we do is we just hook them up together. So this is now a rigid connection between them. And instead of hooking up your yoke here, we'll hook your yoke up over here. So take a yoke, or it could be uh, the control column, could be your rudder pedals, doesn't matter what it is. Here's your yoke and your yoke is linked up to this. So check out what happens. I move the yoke, let's say the yoke input says, I wanna move this way, right? it will be a control cable, it can be a, a rigid linkage, doesn't matter what it is. But let's say we move this whole thing this way. So now what happens is this is a rigid link. This is basically locked in place. I cannot, uh, this is fluid filled all the way through. And since both ports are covered, this is hard as a stone. You're not gonna move that. This is incompressible fluid in here. It might as well be made out of steel. So instead what's gonna happen is that this whole linkage is going to deflect this way, right? It's gonna push the selector valve in that way. Then that causes this whole selector to move in and it's gonna start, fluid is gonna start entering this side of the port. That causes fluid to come, high pressure to come in here. Fluid is gonna leave that this side and your entire system is going to start moving on this side of the fulcrum that way. Your flight control is gonna start deflecting. It's gonna move over to this part and eventually it'll 
lever itself back over to the neutral position. So now this is gonna feed back to itself and it's gonna close off the port when the flight control has reached the commanded position that you've desired. And the reverse is gonna happen in the other direction, right? So far, everybody with me or who is not clear on this? This is simple mechanical feedback. Everybody so far with me? All right, so first step would be, let's go and make this in steps. So this would be step one. This is gonna deflect here. This is all step one. After that, we get step two. So now this is our yoke input here. Step two, the hydraulic flight control is gonna start moving. It's going to deflect. So this right here is step two. And step three, we're gonna get a reverse feedback here. Ports are gonna close off again. And again, the flight control is locked in position. Now, in reality, what happens, it, you don't have this level of high deflection on it. In reality, as soon as you start deflecting this a fraction of a millimeter, a little bit, ever so slightly, this is immediately gonna start moving together with you to counteract your input. Because this fluid, just a fraction of a millimeter open on a port is immediately gonna start dumping fluid in here. And it's gonna start the flight control, it's gonna start the actuator. So it sort of looks like more like this thing is fixed. It would look like to you, like this thing is fixed and you're just moving the yoke and this thing is following you. But in reality, whoop. But in reality, what it's doing is it's basically giving you massive hydraulic power assist. So your for control forces are fairly light. In fact, you don't really feel this for these forces at all because they go along this axis, right? So on this flight control, the forces go along this axis and you're parallel to them. So you're not gonna feel those. Um, but to you, it feels like you've got massive le leverage essentially, um, or, or it's essentially power assisting your movement. But what would happen, let's think about this. What happens if all of a sudden this thing got jammed in here, right? So you cannot do anything. You got a jam. Not the kind you can eat, but you know the kind that that prevents you st stuff from moving. So all of a sudden now, your your the step three here would not happen at all anymore. So with a jam in place, you just get to step two. Strawberry jam, sure. Maybe your raspberry. Um, Lone Star. Nobody gives me the raspberry. Anyway, um. So you just be moving the input linkage here and nothing will be happening. So what would that, what, what would that cause? That would presumably mean um, that you essentially have no way to, you know, control space balls reference. Yes. <laughs> so you'd have no ability. You would, even though you'd be supplying pressure. So let's say you uncover the port, you've got pressure in this side of the system or you move it the other way, you've got pressure in this side of the system. Since this is jammed in place, it ain't going nowhere. So how do we know about that? How do we know that this selector valve is not working at all? And the way it works in the, in the Challenger is there's a, another little valve here, um, sort of, something sort of like this. Uh, again, symbolic, I'm, I'm just trying to, I'm just trying to sort of uh, demonstrate the principle here, not necessarily, you know, show you exactly how it's built because diagrams are, these are just just conceptual diagrams. Um, we'll have another set of lines. Or something like that. Um, we'll have another set of lines here, let me think. Um, Yeah, that'll do. Um, and we'll have a 
we'll have a return line here. So this is again supply. So this is highly pressurized. And then the return is low pressure here. And crucially, this is linked up to another input linkage here, like so. And we'll put a, it's a little bit complicated to, to conceptualize here with the inaccurate drawing that I'm doing, but you'll, you'll sort of get the picture. Uh, we'll put a pressure monitoring device here, something that checks for essentially the static pressure in that line here. So if this fluid is highly pressurized but not moving very fast, this is gonna be sitting at very high pressure. But if your yoke is moving the, uh, if your yoke is moving the selector valve very far, uh, such that it basically uncovers this port, so it basically moves this either that way or that way. Stand by. So it uncovers that port. It basically connects this line to that line. It dumps pressure out of this line. I think there's like a flow rate limiting device here to prevent excessive uh, flow out of there. But what that basically causes is the pressure in this monitoring system here gets dumped to low. This becomes very low pressure because you've moved the selector valve, uh, because you've moved this selector valve very far out of center. And that causes the system here to think, oh crap, we've lost. Uh, th this valve should really not go all that far, meaning um, this is probably jammed. It's not responding to the hydraulic inputs, right? So that is your jam detector. So if this shows low pressure, that indicates that um, that we've lost hydraulic, we've, we've, we've lost the control of this here actuator. This actuator ain't doing anything at all anymore. So what happens if the whole thing is though depressurized in here, right? What if we don't have the hydraulic pumps running? This will also show a jam. Right, makes sense. So the way that the um, jam detector functions or the reason for that aileron mono K message. So this here thing, aileron mono OK. The reason for that is that there are, you can check them out over here. One, two, three, four aileron actuators. I'm gonna make it larger. Yeah, there are one, two, three, and four aileron actuators. And this message comes on if all four are reporting jammed and all three hydraulic systems are reporting low pressure. Because that condition presumably can only happen if we've got, if all hydraulic systems are reporting less than 800 PSI and all the actuators are reporting jam or low pressure in this monitoring device, then this message comes on to tell you, hey, we are detecting jams on all, con on all flight controls, which is the expected state with low pressure in all systems, meaning the jam detectors are working. As soon as I pressurize them, as soon as I pressurize one of the hydraulic systems, doesn't matter which one, let's say we're, we'll pressurize system one. That message goes away because now this jam monitor has either Stop reporting that there's an aileron jam. One of those. If the if the um, if the detector is good, then it'll stop reporting that there's an aileron jam. Or we have the system highly pressurized, meaning whatever, right? We're not gonna uh, we're not gonna show that message. But at this point, the system is now monitoring for an aileron jam. So now now would actually report if we had an aileron jam. So you can see right now, if I deflect it, the left aileron, I'm gonna make it larger again. The left aileron is again moving fine. What if I jam the aileron? I can do that. I can jam just, I can jam either the aileron mechanically or I can just jam the hydraulic PCU. So we'll go to flight controls, PC, 
Aileron System 1 PCU is jammed. I'm going to try. Hang on. Yeah. See? Not really moving anywhere. Aileron PCU. Oh, yeah. I, as a corner case, I need to handle better. Actually, let's... Uh, Let's unjam you. I'm gonna power cycle the airplane. The message goes away. I'm gonna pressurize both systems or two systems. Let's do a dual PCU jam just for funsies. Is that actually gonna give me what I want? Okay, there we go. Oh no, hang on. Why are you reporting? Oh no, oh, I'm an idiot. Uh, right, because I'm mute. No, 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 it's working right. I, I was just being an idiot. Um, clear all faults. Power cycle the system because the message latches on there. Here they having roll spoilers. Could be, could be. Um, I don't know. So anyway, uh, ailerons are working fine. Let's just depressurize system two, or system three, actually. Wait, 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 wait. Good stuff. Oh, I still got the rudder trim, don't I? Yes, I do. Just noticed that the flight controls were deflected. No, oh, the rudder was deflected. Good. Uh, right. So the way that the system detects it is that basically as soon as I put the yoke input in there is when it sees the, the jam condition. But I have to have, um, I have to have pressure in the system. So currently I can still move it fine. But if I, let's say, I'm going to drain the system. Stand by just for, for just one sec. Alrighty. Now we got the aileron mono K okay again. And if I jam the PCU now, uh, no, hang on, we do want to trigger you. If I jam the PCU now, I, I basically can't move the flight control. I have to basically pressurize the system again so that it snaps out of it and thinks that everything's fine. Oh, hang on, I, I didn't actually fail the system. Crapperinos. Okay, depressurize again. There we go, close enough. PCU1 jam. So PCU1 is not moving, but I'm not getting, I'm still seeing aileron mono, mono okay and no other message. That means it can't distinguish now. It, it sees okay, there's low pressure on the aileron PCU. But it doesn't know if that is simply because we don't have any pressure here or because you're moving the yoke in the cockpit and messing around with it. And basically, the, the PCU would not be moving anyway. So how would it know? Or the, the actuator would not be moving anyway. But as soon as I pressurize it, it knows that, okay, now you should have been able to move the, the PCU or, or, or the flight control. So now, as long as I don't move the yoke, it won't know. But as soon as I move the yoke far enough that it will get out of center, get out of the selector valve region. So I'll show you the yoke here so you can kind of see how far it doesn't have. It's not very far that I need to go. A little bit, a little bit, a little bit, a little bit. There we go. It's already detected at aileron PCU. So what was that? Maybe one eighth of a turn? That's the maximum misalignment basically between the yoke and the flight controls at a given time. And we got a little amber circle in there, semicircle over the aileron telling us, hey, that one's gone. And we no longer have an aileron mono okay, and we have an aileron PCU jam indication. Now, since I don't have any pressure on system three, uh, system three aileron cannot, um, System 3 aileron PCU cannot operate, right? So there are there's a dual redundant PCU system here. 
but I cannot uh, get it to move right now with no system free pressure. So let's give system free pressure. And we should have a functional aileron again. Now what I've also done here, unfortunately, as I was explaining before, this thing, if it's jammed, it's basically locked in place. It ain't going anywhere. So how do we actually, you know, there are two now two PCUs that are competing with trying to move that flight control, right? So there's another one, there's another piston and all, all everything is doubled up. How do we know, you know, how do we, how do we get one to move and not the other one to move? And the difference is that there's a shear pin in here. And when these two get misaligned far enough, that'll basically snap. And they'll disconnect them, and the one that's jammed is basically going to become sheared off from the flight control. So now, since I've had system 3 pressure, I've put on system 3 pressure. And I've moved the flight controls, and I've shorn, shorn off the pin. So let's depressurize system 3. And I'm going to unjam system 1 PCU. Now I'm going to drain system three. And system three is interesting. Oh, no, hang on. Uh, yeah, I, I restore the pin. Huh. Yeah, that's why. Normally, when you do this in reality, um, even if you lost, lost system three at this point, I restore the pin. But the pin would have been shorn off. You wouldn't be able to move the flight con the aileron anymore at this point. Yeah, I should probably should I put that back in or not? I don't know. Let me check the source kit just to make sure. Yeah, it's for shear rivets. Blah 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 blah. There we go. Yeah. If we don't have a jam here, I'll I reset the shear rivets. If I didn't have this piece of code in there, it would simply stop being operable via the through the through the sheared off uh, PCU. Editor colors make your eyes bleed. Really? Oh, you might have a different color balance. I'm used to this. For me, this is normal. There a no color option there. Better? That red on blue. Yeah, training vice. Red on blue. What do you mean red on blue? It's just now it's gray. This text is gray. Yellow. This is brown. Sorta of brown, I guess. Yes, the background is blue. Oh, there you go. Feeling better? <laughs> oh, you have partial color blindness. Yeah, if you have trouble seeing colors, yeah, then I could understand that this would be weird. Oh, there you go. Monochrome. Yeah, we've run into that issue where one of our testers is also having some trouble distinguishing between, I think, yellow and red. This is a pretty, which is one, I think one of the most com common uh, types of color impairedness is uh, red, red, yellow color blindness. Anyway. Oh, wait, tablet? There's a brown, brown on blue looked like it was vibrating. Oh, my me though. Okay, yeah, well, it shouldn't be vibrating. It might be possible that you're, yeah, you're having trouble distinguishing it. Interesting, because there are very, blue is the weakest color receptor in the eye. I had to ask Brian what, 
color than something yellow was. The color blindness is why I'm not an actual pilot. I see, yeah. I do color vision research and my red green color blindness is the most prevalent from what I've seen. Had to be away for some time. Did I miss surprise? Amber, I don't know. Deuteranop Deuteranopia. Red ink. Yeah, it's the most prevalent. Interesting, because uh, blue is the weakest receptor that we have. Uh, blue is interesting. I presume in the U.S. you still have a driver's license. Is that not a disqualifying characteristic there? Because I think here, if you, if you have, if you're colorblind. Uh, that type i think you might not actually get a driver's license if they figure it out that is professor in college that was monochromatic he had a commercial pilot's license <clears throat> how the hell did he get that for that good job i didn't go that way to be honest interesting because here you did you do if they figure out you're colorblind, you, you're going to lose your license. Of course, plenty of people are uh, red-green colorblind. It's just they somehow they passed the test. I don't know how, but they did. Funnily enough, which means in practice, you could be VFR daytime, pilot license, but no driver's license. So you could fly a plane, but not drive a car. Where's here? Well... Table 123, I don't want to say exactly the space, but Europe. Somewhere in Europe. Happy and Vasculites, I can't tell the difference between green and white. Yes. Well, left hand is, there are no green lights on a Pappy or a Vasi. Interesting. Get a statement of demonstrated ability. Right, yeah, I see. Handheld radios weren't available, so he was day flight only. Ah, right. Yes. And Pappy is white and red, yeah. But if you can't tell them apart yet, ultimately makes no difference, really. Right color Vazzy. Wow, that's I don't think I've ever seen that one. Must be something really old, not in use anymore. Anyway, uh, long story short about this uh, jam thing, um, since the jam system has no way to detect, um, so say for instance you recenter your flight controls and it gets again back in alignment with the PCU uh, what that's going to cause is um, that's going to cause is basically this will get realigned this will get repressurized and you would get the jam indication going away so I basically latch the message here for the aileron PCU for a long time basically until the avionics is rebooted essentially if you have an aileron jam um, you're done flying for the day, so to speak. And to get rid of it, you have to kill the avionics, restart the avionics. And now since we're pressurized, yes, 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 door, I know. Since we are pressurized, all is well. Message went, went, message went away, no more aileron PCU CAS message. Newton's worst nightmare for GP guidance. Yeah, I can imagine. Yeah. Yep, yep, yep. Unfortunately, uh, Rotan. Sorry for the sidebar, no color. We'll likely get a, you know, some sort of ability. Another FAA, so could fly night red and reg at night. Interesting. 
Happies on green and XP are particularly hard for me. <clears throat> oh, interesting. Anyway, we can fly the aircraft with half the flight controls functional. That'll be fun. Anyway, so there's a truckload of failures in here. Still got to put a few in there. Apparently, I forgot about. Like the fire protection, I want to put in the wing stuff and some of the other stuff. Um, but yeah, oh, all over your flight directors. Yes, that's something I got to work on. Let's go ahead and work on that. <clears throat> no matter question my color vision when getting a driver's license in the UK or Canada that I call. Interesting. I think they do here. But anyway. Good stuff. Uh, so, the flight director crap, right. Uh, let's see. I'm gonna make it I'm gonna make it like this. So alias uh, MC edit NC will be MC edit no color. There we go. I'm gonna make that a standard thing for myself so I can do that on stream. Do 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 MC edit NC will be MC edit no color. Or should I call it NC edit? Yeah, that'll be better. That way I can source bash RC source bash RC throw that into every one of my shells here so looking at the fire loop failures isn't there a pylon loop too um yes um it there is but they are pylon loops are linked up into the a and b system so <clears throat> this here thing behaves the same as jet pipe overheat you have a pylon fire functionally it's the same in other words it would present as jet pipe overheat Or just my, would it actually just say fire? I'm not sure. One of those. Crucially though, even an engine that's on fire still runs and provides thrust. So even if you do have a fire, don't go crazy immediately reducing power and immediately cutting off your thrust supply. You've got an engine fire on takeoff. First takeoff, Consider your options, you know, clean up, uh, be, at least get the gear up. And if there's an engine fire, we can do that. Let's say we've got a distinguishable left engine fire at VR. A oh, fun one. Mm, graphics, uh, no, not sound. Uh, graphics, full screen simulator. Mm. So I'm gonna align everything. Let's see IP from there to there. Perfect it. Give me the fuel status. And we're gonna go off of there. 21 degrees. Send. Get the ICAST back over to the left. So I'm gonna be flying from here. Okay, APU generator is online. And let's go. Spool them. Actually, I gotta close the door here. Did I not put the... Like spots in there. Now we did. 
Uh, yeah, but I gotta use data ref editor here. I haven't put the fix in for the doors. Doors, main, close. Is that close? God oh, damn it. Let's put the fi fix in for the door stuff. What did I do to fix it? Now I'm exploding everybody's ears out. Door. Yes, yes, yes. I know door. Uh, I'll just reload the plane. As a piece of code, I got to fix to get the doors closable. Okay, let's go. Emergency lights, all the other stuff. That, that, that. So I'm an impatient idiot. Okay. Both engines running. That's all looking good. Anti-collision lights. Flaps to take off. Get the trim up. There and give myself an aligned system. A CIP and we're gonna depart. Uh, we're on runway one zero. Yeah, whatever, doesn't matter what Archer, I'm just going to shove something in there. And I want to put in 21C, take off, send. The guidance to prevent knee jerk reactions to any situation except for rapid depressurization. Think of the warning and cautions in terms of how many sips of coffee you can't take. Cautions are two sips. Ding, take a sip of coffee, read the message, take another sip, pull out the QRH and deal with it. Warnings are one sip. Ding, take a sip of coffee, read the message, then pull out the QRH. Interesting, interesting uh, metric, definitely. Um, sounds like a reasonable one to me. We'll take off, take off. And I'm gonna switch you over to that mode. Lovely stuff. Good guidance from my dream. Yeah. <laughs> Training department. Yes. Indeed so. Good, let's go. Um, do I still have the failure programmed in? I don't think I do now. Um, so we want to go fire protection, we'll do a single shot extinguishable at VR. 121 knots to go. And what's the volume like on stream? Eh, it's pretty good. So, your chocks away. And what am I going to do here? Actually, I'm going to get myself actual throttles this time sort of like that cool there we are so take off config okay shocks are away good stuff rock and roll let's go For 91.2 there on the N ones. There's N one hold. 90.9. Rotate. There we go. Engine fire. Cancel the warning here. 
the autopilot on. Not going to do anything for now. There was 400 feet. So first thing first, get the auto thrust out. There's a thousand feet, so I'm going to start reducing power here. Get the autopilot out of there as well. Okay. Fairly happy with this. Now, I need to trim out some rudder. Normally, you would obviously, you know, have proper flight controls and everything. Okay, that's as much rudder trim as I'm going to get. So, that is identified. Left engine shut down. Just the HUD rebooting there as it lost the generator. Right engine is an APR. Left engine, fire push button is pushed. Jet pipe overheat. Okay, fire spread, so boot number one bottle. Engine bottle one's low pressure. Yes, thank you. And obviously this is where having two piles would have helped. Okay, the jet pipe fire is gone. Engine fire is gone, so engine is fire is out. Alright, since I'm a lazy bastard. Can I engage the autopilot? I can. I'm gonna pull power on the good engine. Don't want to be climbing that fast, buddy. Yeah, the autopilot doesn't like this very much. Play with anyone else from the beta team to run an engine fire. Well, you will, don't worry. Once I'm ready to do that, we'll get that, don't worry. Let's go ahead and retract those flaps. That will reduce drag quite a bit. And yeah, aircraft's going to accelerate a lot better. going to turn around and land. Left engine shut down. Left engine S shut off valve, fuel shut off valve. So this is what these messages here mean. I did get a bunch of cast messages about the engine shut down, obviously. So you can see over here, the engine uh, oil pump, or sorry, the engine hydraulic pump is down, because I've shut it down deliberately. Or rather, the, the shutoff valve is closed, so hydraulic shutoff went, valve went closed. Left engine shutoff valve, that's the engine master uh, firewall valve. Um, and then we've got the fuel pump stuff up because the left engine is shut down. Those are your assistance things. APR is still armed, but I don't need it anymore. We're banking a little bit there. And the ignition system I should have disarmed because I'm basically given a bunch of bunch of ignition to the engine. And there's our airport that we want to be landing back at, so I am entirely high on power here. I need to mull out that rudder trim. Not really all that helpful now. And I need more hands than this. There. A little bit of an L out, not too much though. OK. 
Let me get some flaps. Funny story, this actually repressurized system one because I've shut down the engine hydraulic pump. Then system one was depressurized. As if I do this. It thinks that system one is being pressurized by the engine, but it actually isn't. Or is it? Huh. What? Shouldn't be pressurizing there, buddy. Need to check it out. Oh, right, no, it's because the engine's just freewheeling here. No, hang on. No hydraulic valve on. Pressurizing at all. Okay, that's another one of those things I gotta check. Yeah, 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 I know. Twenty-five hundred. Should not be pressurized due to the engine or by the engine. I'll get that sorted in just a moment. Cool. So we got press reversers armed. We have disarm number two. Flying it like a bit of an idiot here, obviously. If I had a better flight control set up here, then I would not be being flown like I'm a completely cross handling arms left and flailing left and right. You guys are going to fly a lot better than I. Flaps full, gear down, everything. Oh, the truck gun by the wrong way. Sure, why not? One hundred. Fifty. Forty. Thirty. Twenty. Ten. Okay, there's 60 knots. I didn't even pull the flight spoilers. Null out that. That, that. Zika, it's uh, SCIP. Isla de Pasqua is, is what its name is. It's it's in the Southern Pacific. The reason why I'm using it for testing is because it's very isolated. It loads really fast. This thing here. Yep, that's the only reason why I'm using it. Come on. Pretty 
There we go. Gonna go hook up the external AC. Oh, I still got APU running. Don't even need external AC. So, fix that thing. Pressurize, and it shouldn't be. Anyway, uh, SCAP, yes. I was going to know some tricks from Vlad. Always happy to provide. Um, yeah. Reason why. Left hand is if you if I show you what the airport what the environment looks like around here. That's it. In fact, if I go a little bit faster. This is why I'm using it for testing. Northern America, Southern America, um smack dab in the middle of nowhere. So that is why <laughs> I use it as a testing airport. Now there's also Midway, PMDY, DVD. Okay. This should be my load test of Midway. Yes. Uh, Midway is, I think, smaller than this. Um, the reason why I'm using Isla de Pasqua or Isla de Pasqua, I don't know. Um, is one of the reasons why Midway is actually smaller. So Midway is, I'd say probably, it's a shorter, slightly shorter runway. It's like 8,000 feet or something. And it's basically just the airport plus a little bit of terrain. Um, this is more terrain, but the reason why I prefer SCIP is it's not that much more terrain. So it really doesn't affect load times much of anything at all. And you have a nice selection of approaches here. So if I show you what the approaches are available here, that are available here, is there's an ILS, RNAV, both um, both a RNAV uh, with AR legs, so with radius fixed legs and without. There's a VOR DME. There's NDBs. And yeah, that's it for, for the instrument approaches. So this airport is good for FMS development because you've got a lot of variety of approaches in here. Really used for ETOPS plan is basically abandoned. Ah, yeah, interesting. Whereas for Midway, if I show you what they have available. EMDY, not BPMDY. EMDY. Depart, arrive, arrive, and that's it. RNAV, NDB, and that's it. So, Midway is fairly limited for approaches. Uh, and even more interesting, these are offset localizer approaches. So, they even give you more variety in the sense that um, you can see that it's it's not um, directly aligned with the runway. In fact, I can show you over yonder. Uh, I'll bring up you, and we go to charts. Oh, oh right, I don't have Navigraph set up. Standby. Just one sec. I think I dumped my Navigraph setup, didn't I? Yes, I did. I need to reboot the avionics. Hang on, wrong button. This button here. Okay. So. Uh, it falls. Yeah, whatever. I forgot to turn on the... You know, lights, the emergency exit lights. So those are going to be on. Get rid of this. All the hydraulic pumps. Get the chocks in. 
means I can release the parking brake. Yes, emergency lights on. It's a little bit pissed off there. Reset that button. Right reverser is armed, so get rid of this. Cool. Oh, I overheated the engine, didn't I? Oh yeah. This is very much marginal. 350 degrees Celsius on the ITT. I basically came in guns blazing on the engines and then immediately taxied in a shutdown. I should have waited for three minutes after parking. With Hawaii. Yes. Uh, let's see. Okay, so go away there. Now I can go in user settings and if I push this and fire up the avionics again. Actually, I can show you what this looks like like that. Won't make that much of a difference. We have, we don't have external AC, so I'm gonna hook up the external AC. But I don't care much about approaches. These e three barely can stay in. <laughs> of course, with autopilot. Okay, yeah, that's. So I've enabled Navigraph here. Pretty soon it should give me the prompt to log in. Once the file server unit has booted up. Maybe, or do I still have a valid token? The hell? Why did you deselect? Yeah, never wrath. Hmm. Gonna have to debug this. Why aren't you working? So let's hop on in here. No, it's gonna be under IFIS, FSU. Uh, where are you? FSU 5010. Hmm. Yeah, whatever. I'll figure it out later. Something's bugged in my code. Usual. Not all that unusual. Cool. Uh, let's see, what did I want to work on next? Right, over your flight directors. So to get that out of the way, what I wanted to test is... Hmm. <laughs> so that'll be in... My apps. Yeah. FCC four thing. Actually, let's take a let, let's let's take a quick bathroom break, five minutes, and then I'll be back. Let's see if I can get this fixed or implemented or stuff like that. Cool. Talk to you in five minutes, folks.
Alrighty, back here. I don't need to see myself. I'm gonna move you into a teeny tiny window here at the bottom. Point you up at the sky. You're not consuming a whole lot of CPU for me. And what I wanna be looking at here is this guy here. Uh, how do we steer you actually? You think? Your roll. Uh huh. Right, I know. <laughs> right, 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 right. So I need to redesign something in the flight director system. What do I need to redesign here? Yeah. So instead of FD roll, FD pitch. Yeah, yeah, yeah. FD roll. Not oh, Eric, FD roll. Roll limit. <laughs> Essentially, the problem right now that I'm trying to solve is <clears throat> the fact that the flight directors are a little bit too jittery. Um, sort of. How do I solve it in such a way such that it works well in every case? FCC, FD control. Hmm. Set target roll. It should be fairly relaxed. Roll update rate. This is the thing that we're using for CCFD. The roll, stern roll is the RS roll. Uh-huh, uh-huh. These are steering target. Hmm. Basically, the real flight directors are fairly lenient in how they follow and what sort of commands they give you. And they'll put two square. Um, they'll, uh, they, they won't sway quite as much as mine do, which I'm not too happy about. And the vertical flight, I might have to deal with the vertical and lateral flight director separately. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, probably. Now, I could solve that on the receiving side or on the display side. Simply by way of a little bit of code, I guess. Did I predict the roll rate? 
Nah, that would over exaggerate it. Should I just filter them low pass? Probably that's what I'm gonna do. So we're not gonna do this in the flight control computer. I'm a VQ user now, or whatever it's called. Well then you're just wrong. Ah, FD roll relative. There we are. FD roll rel. What are you? Ah. FD PFD. FD roll relative. I think I already had an attempt at solving this. If I make you like one. Let's see, reload, and let's see what it's going to do. Also, FD roll relative. Let's just go for a fly out, I guess. Um, we'll go ahead and give ourselves some of that fine, fine APU goodness. Who is available? That's still from after I had that fire. <laughs> Role playing CL650 pilot. I think he he became a crossbar guy. I think we might have converted him. <laughs> that, 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 that. Generators on the bus. Can I get rid of the APU here? Just for shits and giggles. What are you still complaining about? Hydraulic pumps. Yes. About that. Engine bottle one low. Don't need you. And now if I test the squibs, it shouldn't. Well, they are continuous. They're just empty. <laughs> Okay, anyway, um... <clears throat> survey of videos, VQs is popular with the corporate world. Yes, it is, for no reason at all, which I, at least I, no reason that I can determine. And we're gonna go like 200, maybe 180 knots. And pause. and ATS please no oh feel a destination yes I know you're a little bit unhappy about that I'll sort you out I'll sort you out real good by deleting your destination and there you go now you're quiet about it And also, I'm going to mull out that rudder trim. It's a bit too far. There we go, that's center. Sweet. I was going to try something different. I've always flown V bar 121, 35. Yeah, I know. 
Let's use an excuse to not fly accurately to the flight director. Yeah. Man, I had a nice analogy about that. Ah, no, I know. I know, I know, I know, I know. Iris roll, iris pitch. Yep, 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 yep. I know what the issue here is. I need to redesign it a little bit differently. Um, I just think of a way to do it without pissing off my state file. If the impulse, so, if the roll rel, no, hang on. Right, 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 right. If the roll relative degrees and uh, yeah, so go linear and three degrees per second. Let's do it like that. Let's see what this changes. What I th think it's gonna do. Reload. A good aviator has such a an awareness to know where to put the plane and use the FD as backup. Sure. I mean, that's, I guess, a way to look at it as well. Displaying anyway. AFDADI.C. Yes, FD roll relative. Pixels per degree vertical, pixels per degree horizontal is three. I'll just go real slow. I wonder what would happen here. Hmm, no, hang on, I know. Yeah, no, 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 no. Yeah, yeah. You know, I know I've got this design a little bit wrong. Uh, let's see, it's FCC at the roll. You know, I got the, I got to redesign this a little bit. Not roll relative. I mean, that is fine. Display data. That one's completely serialized, isn't it? Yeah, it is. So I'm going to chuck you in here at the roll target just for funsies. So if we've got a failure, FD, IRS, FD, AFCS, blah, 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 sure. FD roll relative is nothing. Then we're going to go filter and linear. EFD. D roll. No, 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 not that one. Um, filter and linear. EFD. Uh, FD roll target. Uh, flight director role. Yes, and you're going to be filtering it at, let's say, three degrees per second. You roll target. Let's see if this helps. Missed the past couple hours. Afternoon snooze. <laughs> uh, yeah, flight director changes. Yes. 
Unfortunately, you missed the ex the whole giant ginormous explanation that involved a lot of drawing of what the aileron mono K means. But it's on VOD, so if you want to see it, you can. Yeah, everyone snooze. So yeah. stuff and let's see what happens here cool this looks better even slower yeah that's a part of the stream that put him to sleep ah right yeah that might be an issue then Two point five, two point five, somewhere around there. Yeah, let's see. the vertical FD might be okay mostly anyway that's looking pretty good Less, I guess. So general maneuvering. Just a little bit quick. Let me think. Just for funsies. Hey, Vryonyx, thanks for the raid here. Welcome aboard. My lot fiddle. Hey, <laughs> Aleem A. Hey, hey. <laughs> Alrighty. That's that. Okay, so, and now if I... Okay, so it's not as, as bad as before. Put her, put her with some turbulence on there. Got a wind layer going. Coming from the, about there-ish. Like that, some turb. And some gusting. Sure, why not? Not looking good as ever. Well, I'm glad you like it. Big crafts, welcome. Any chance to get a look at the outside? 
Sure. Looks like that. Looks like an airplane. There's still stuff to be done, obviously. Oh, yeah. Getting there. Hmm. Can I make it variable? The rate at which it displaces. Could I guess it changes from linear filtering to this kind of filtering? Sometimes between then and now, those are getting to release. <laughs> we like to say soon. Trademark first good biz jet, hopefully. Yeah. Two point three, give or take, for the filtering rate. What had a king? Will there be documents and everything? Uh, uh probably not. <laughs> The amount of documentation that we need to provide would be essentially like a full plan, like an actual aircraft. It's definitely a lot more stable, I guess. On the flight director, let's just go ahead and do an offset here. If you follow the flight director, it's it's fine. Basically, I want the bar here to see more of us. Didn't know how to spell his name. Graham. Just Graham when you need it. Oh, Graham's around, don't worry. Hmm. Like one, we let's just see the funsies. You get the cone stuff where it can. All right, that you that looked like some pretty horrible calculus that needed to be done. Am 
why am I unbalanced like that? Okay, yeah. I know why, because I got 400 pounds more fuel on one side than the other. Uh, APU is offline, so I'm just going to equalize the two sides. Just for funsy, CL650 fuel tank mass. Put in 2,000 on the left side, 2,000 on the right side. There we go. That director is aligned. I'm going to make you like 1.5. That was pretty good back there. Don't worry, all those CLCC looks complicated. It's very, very easy to flaunt, get into script depth. There's only some interesting Tetris here scripts, and those are very useful to work out the field balance process just by looking at the schematic and the text on the debug screen. I'm actually considering renaming that menu from debug to like study menu or something. Instead of debug, it would say study. What's that thing on the bottom of the PFD? The yoke? Or what? Or on the screen here. Green on the horizon. Uh, flight path vector. Or are, are you also doing the texturing? No, texturing is being done by somebody else. That is the flight path vector, same thing as this thing here. So if I go ahead and kill the autopilot, you'll be able to see it. That's the actual direction the aircraft's flying in space. So casually flexes the pixel effect on the screen on the PFD. <laughs> yeah. I guess you can see it, huh? this let's see actually I also want the FD pitch target I'm gonna do the same with that thing do, 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 do. FD pitch target FD pitch and you I want to change actually I don't now let's keep that one as is. For the time being. I recommend watching the VOD. There's already a lot of work with the avionics itself. Oh, you have... No, I just started watching. That's fine. Asking the sea of failures. <laughs> now, there's a lot of them. Good rule of thumb is, I've never seen Toto half-ass anything. Uh, I'm... I've done plenty of, plenty of, I guess, garbage stuff. Uh, let's see. Full screen. Like that. Just for my convenience. And you can get rid of that thing on the bottom if you want. So it's this. Also.
channels, so let me just point the aircraft out some terrain here. Hmm. It also has a synthetic vision system. So let's go up in speed. your headset on I guess if you want it hmm are we happy with this flight director the way it's behaving now Synthetic on you, all natural pasture, pasture raised. Okay, free range vision. Sure. <laughs> Night lights in the cockpit. I can, yeah, CD systems, not a problem. Put the heading to 90 degrees off, then engage heading. Right, sure. Yes, I can. So, uh, night lighting, right? It it does provide spilled light. How do I make X plane go really dark? Whatever. X plane really doesn't like being smart about stuff. Okay. It's giving me like a moonlit night. What if I change the... How about here? Is there... Would this be a moonless night? Moonless night, nothing. Um, apparently no. x -Plane still gives me like a sort of vague shade of something. Even with a mountain train at 5,000. And this of course... Yes, I will reflect a reality sim momentarily, so... Here's some indirect lighting, and you also got your right flood, left flood. Those are coming down. Well, we need to put like lamps in here. Those are coming down from the rills. Got your footwell. Floor light there, floor light there. Obviously, integrity lighting, or integral lighting, that's the one. Left integral, right integral, that's the flood. There's these blue reflections at the top of the glare show that night. Couldn't figure out what it was. Yeah, that's what it is. Also, this responds to, say, for instance, if I change the color, you'll get the light here changing shade. Uh, let's see, I wanted to turn you off. Turn the indirect lighting off. So, and also, if I go ahead and make it more blue, well, I guess. Or, uh, you know, 
bit of an idiot here. Let a pilot engage. Yes, these guys are providing a little bit of spill light as well. And you can dim these down, obviously, so... If you want... Just turning in. How's it going? Hey, CL650 pilot, welcome. We had a long discussion about all kinds of weird stuff. I'm tuning the flight director now. Oh yeah, this one's fun. This is a fun one because that's a little bulb in there, basically, the light guide to provide in indirect lighting because there is no integrity integral lighting on that lamp. So instead, it uses like a simple bulb. And same thing down here for these two guys, for this one and this one. Cool. CL650 pilot, as you can see, I've had some fun with the engine. And I'm just so drop it into roll mode, set it off by 90 degrees, like so. Re-engage heading mode, yes, was the suggestion. That looks good. I need to fix this one to also operate on the same principle. That seems to be about right. you a linear ramp. Oh, yeah. There, if I made you a linear ramp, like 1.5 degrees per second, and not line, lin. Reload. Did you see a little bit of left command? During the initial roll, yes, a little bit. Well, yeah, I guess. Let's do the test again. This is enough to achieve full deflection. Unless I'm not happy with this isn't looking better. And that's because this and like so. Like, hang on, like so. Bit of a wiggle, yeah. Just trying to fine tune it. It should pretty well stay aligned with this. The thing is, I'm gonna get rid of the HUD here. I do have a button to hide it, don't I? Where do I have that button? Uh, I wouldn't want to be pushing the wrong button to like shut down the engines or something. Nose up, nose down, flaps, nothing. Yeah, there we go, HUD combiner. Yeah. Focus on you. Mm 
Okie doke. Okay, I'm fairly well. I think this is pretty close to fire what I remember the real thing does. It might have made it too laggy. Hmm. Go. Yeah. It's targeting three degrees per second roll rate. What's that? That's the city. Huh. It's targeting three degrees per second roll rate on the flight director. If memory serves, hang on. Let me check my code, actually. FCC steering, roll. Pretty close anyway. <laughs> Let me check the actual data refs or the uh, data refs, the actual data that's running in. So that'll be on LFCC one. And we are looking for FD rolls with minus 30. Sorry, you might not be able to see it on stream because it's very, very tiny. There it goes. I suppose this could be it. I, I don't know. If I disconnect you, go over yonder. I'm gonna go ahead and kill the autopilot. I'm gonna try and steer it manually. So, as they say, if you follow the flight director, you're gonna be constantly behind the airplane. So if I just follow the flight director exactly, very fast. The airplane's a little bit jittery. If I've made it too dull now, I guess. What do you think? Reflective reality sim? The hell? Okay, I gotta get rid of these. Some of these buttons on the... Or I could, I suppose, just... 
disconnect the thing and just be done with it. Some of the buttons there have faults and they'll... Well, you can also extend the flaps, why the hell not? Some of the knobs on that old SideTech X55 are just randomly generating inputs. It's all great and great fun. Alrighty. I mean, I'm not sure I can make it any more stable without making them too dull or making them too basically lagging behind. In this case, yes, you need to lead them with if you're flying manually. Um, so if I go like this, go manual flight, heading hold. Then I gotta turn in man manually at a reasonable rate here, up to 30. Flight director comes to follow me, pretty much. And I forgot to roll out, I was staring at the flight director. Make it daytime again. Boring flying at night here. My joystick has a pretty crappy center point where this is just me barely pushing on the stick and this is the amount of deflection I'm getting. Same thing side to side. There's little, very little fine control around the center. Ends the bobbing motion. I don't know. Also deployed fly spoilers, why not? Anyway, assuming that this is more or less okay, I'm gonna implement the same trick here in the in the roll function on the HUD. The separate computer. Heads up guidance computer implementation. No. Derive data. Sure, we'll put you in here. Roll to retarget. So if the roll relative Oh, interesting. I don't have that piece of functionality in that guy. So to that end, so I'm going to just pull this out of into a common function piece of functionality. Um, AFD impulse. So that you can actually see what I'm doing. FD FD. F the roll rel there and degrees. And I'm gonna make you into a piece of common functionality. So you're gonna go into ephis.h. Basically my sort of common dumping ground for a bunch of shared functionality between the ephis subsystems. Yeah, you're gonna just go into ephis.h and you're gonna go and I'm gonna create a little data structure here to, here to hold it all. Um, yeah, you're gonna go in here. Type def struct ephis fdt. Alrighty, and Right, right, cool. 
the roll blah 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 sure and then we're gonna have a little static uh unused adder static void ephis update fd and for that functionality pfd.c so what do you need you need to know the whether it has failed update fd rel fd irs roll irs pitch fd roll fd pitch so let's just transplant this crap over double delta time so we don't need the pfd pointer but we do need the fd pointer so fd pointer good 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 irs roll irs pitch or if we have fd roll FD pitch, then FD, and instead of being called FD roll, you're gonna just be called a roll relative. There we go. Roll rel, roll target, pitch rel, good. FD pitch relative. Good, good, good. Okay, FD roll target update from FD roll. Good, good, good. IRS roll to the FD roll target. Lamp per. IRS pitch to the FD pitch input. Good. My right hand. Huh. It's even shareable between the two pieces of crap, or do I need to re implement it separately? There is no compact mode. Hmm. No compact mode display on the heads up guidance computer. Eh, it's just going to get more complicated if I do it like that. So, FD roll target, FD pitch rel, and you're going to be all in units of degrees. I'm not going to centralize that piece of functionality. It's just, just going to be more condition. It's just going to be overcomplicated. So, instead, um, Going to do a little bit of code duplication despite all my hatred for it. Get diff. You roll target, roll relative. Good, 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 good. Stuff. Almost. And so in here, we're going to go and like that so that you guys don't have to look at my color there. PFD data and PFD data roll target. Good stuff. Heads up guidance computer. HTC impul. FD roll rel. Pitch rel. And I'm going to have to re implement this. Um, HTC. <clears throat> okay, HGC main. IRS data, FMC data, LNAV, IP 
instrument comparator, fail boxes, unusual attitude. So update FD relative HGC delta time. Static void HGCT pointer double DT. HGC is not null and HGC or delta time is greater than zero. So that's our basic assertions done. AFD PFD dot C. So do we have a fail flag? And I can't see if I have tabs in there or not. Okay, now I can. Cool. Um, so, heads up guidance computer. So, what does the heads up guidance computer have as inputs? Should have. EFIS air data computer IRS data. Okay. So this will be in HGC IRS role, HGC IRS pitch, FD, FD active. Okay. So that'll be in HGC heads up guidance computer, FD active. Huh. I think I need to address a slight issue here. If the flight director is not active, then I want to set PFD data, FD role target to nothing as well. And if this guy is not set, then we will initially snap it to the target. Afterwards, we will smoothly animate it. Okay, and stuff, I think, or no, hang on, well, what are we, no, 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 what I'm going to do here is I'm going to snap you initially to the aircraft orientation there, like that. And then it'll smoothly transition over to where the actual flight director is located. Yep, 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 yep. Heads up guidance computer. If there is no FCC input, then don't do anything. And HGC FD roll relative FD roll target. HGC. Do I have fail flags here? Fail flags, fail boxes, sure. How do I determine you? Update fail boxes. All right, yeah, I need to actually be looking at Right, so this this would be set if actually that takes care of these. Huh. I'll get to know. So this is not required here. We're not active or okay, 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 okay. This is all good. Do 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 do. Here we go. We don't have a roll target, snap the roll target to our current orientation in space, IRS roll. Otherwise, smoothly animate it over. And I might make these some sort of a symbolic constant or something I, I haven't decided yet. And we'll grab the relative roll and pitch angles. 
max 30. I gotta check how the, the guidance computer actually draws. Uh, let's see, edit. So, draw, how do I do what I call these? Draw flight director, HTC ADI render. Yeah, okay. And it draws artificial horizon, flight path vector, right? Draw FPV, that, that sort of rings a bell because it's part of the flight path vector, the flight director on, a, on the heads up guidance computer. Uh, blah, blah, blah. FCC FD roll. Now, how do I do you? Okay, there we go. Right, 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 right. Yep, yep, yep. Pyro arc. Relative roll. I have a, right, this guy's clamped to 20 degrees of roll error. So I'm gonna limit you there. D pitch is HGC IRS data, heads up guidance computer FCC D pitch. And do I have a constraint for you? Yes, plus or minus five degrees. So clamp from minus five to plus five relative. Good. And then the rest of it is, if this is nothing, then center it. Good. So if these are not initialized, then HGC FD roll relative, HGC FD roll relative set to zero. Same thing for the relative pitch axis. Pitch, that's a couple extra letters there. And finally animate them onto the correct spot. EFD data just replace it like that. Right, cool. If it compiles, well, I didn't put in a bunch of mistakes. 2935 data. Good. Heads up guidance computer 1496. 1496, right, uh, HTC. A lot fewer mistakes this time, 1499. Relative angle. And the IRS roll to the there. All right, I didn't declare these. So delta D roll, D pitch. Looking better. And this guy. Right, so instead of using this, this is just going to be looking at FD roll rel, FD pitch rel, and we're only going to do that if not as nan and not as nan, or rather, if these are nan, then just return. Get rid of all of this junk here. All of this junk here. These are just, this can, these can be static cons because they're never gonna change. Roll offset, pitch offset. Good. One, five, three, two. All oh, right, uh, actually, we did delete all my variables. So roll off, pitch off. So now they should be behaving more or less consistently. Now if I reload the plane here, it's gonna be very pissed off because I've basically, um, I've changed the structure layouts a little bit. So it's not actually gonna reload them successfully. So I just gotta wait. I might have to reinitialize the plane sort of in mid flight. You'll see, and it's pretty pissed off. Do I have trim? I don't. Bank angle, bank angle. 
Bank angle. Bank angle. And the bank IRS is are bank very bank pissed angle. off as well. Bank angle. Bank angle. Bank angle. Bank angle. So I have a little key command bound for that. There. They are now back in line. You can see the flight control computers all lost their state, so I need to pull back up to some sensible. And I kill the yaw damper, so that one's required for the flight control computers to operate. Sync up heading. Vertical speed down. And we also need to give it some thrust target. And with that, the ATS can function. Nobody said anything in a long time. I guess you just don't want me to go off on tangents again, huh? Fair enough. I do do that. Still watching. Okay. Yep, they're pretty much behaving identically to each other. And if I go into manual flight, roll you over to three zero zero. Manual flight, heading hold. Okay, and if I just follow the flight director on the on the HUD here. If I lead the flight director, or basically just fly like a normal pilot, as in not follow it like a dog, then we are pretty well on point for the hitch target. I'm wondering if I should make it more or less responsive. I know it does sometimes snap very quickly. Like for instance, when you select um, Togo on the ground, it just swings up like at light speed um at least the roll one is a little bit more reflex relaxed a little bit less steering when the aircraft is still increasing in bank angle to the right i'm not sold on yeah just as approaching 30 degrees angle of bank i'd expect the neutral flight director to signal stop banking after that The neutral flight director. Mm -hmm. <laughs> hmm. Stop banking. Trouble is. I know what you mean. The trouble is that maybe I'm just banking too fast.
Hmm. Have a look. We can debug this thing with some analytics here. Just shove that in there. So for funsies. For funsies, let's put this in here. You're at 25 degrees right bank at 130 right bank, but the FD is commanding left. Yeah, the problem there is, huh. I guess I know what you, what I could do here. It will be a bit of a hack, but it will never, it will prevent giving you a reverse sense. Yeah, let's do it like this. It's going to be a bit of a nasty approach, but I guess it'll do. Um, if PFD data FCCFD role is greater than so like this so i'm going to put you down here it's greater than so if, if the role is relative to our right pfd data irs role then we can go pfd data if the role target is max between this and my current role. So it'll never give a reverse sense. Otherwise, it'll do the min function. Role target is min of if the role target this will basically drag it drag it to to a point where it's never going to give a reverse sense. Check it out. You're going to get rid of the HUD there so it doesn't confuse us. Ready, go away HUD. And now if I disable this guy, like that. What do you think? It gives you a little bit of left, but it will never lag behind. Man, that's a convoluted algorithm. But I guess if it reproduces the real behavior. In fact, what I'm thinking, I can now increase the rate at which it rolls in initially. Like 2.5 degrees. That would make the initial swing a little bit more aggressive. That should still be something that we can catch up to. Try following it manually and see how it feels. Uh, sure, yeah, I, I will.
I got you guys for the feeling part. I just do the algorithms. Okay, piss off heading mode. Come back, Mr. Heading mode. I don't know, feels like a flight director, I guess. I mean, it's workable. And if you just completely disregard it. If I roll around like an idiot, it doesn't jump around too much. I don't know, should it go faster, slower? <laughs> Just me being an idiot. <laughs> Yeah, so if, if you roll in much more aggressively, it won't try to fight you. So let's go and disable heading mode. It should slowly wheel itself back to wherever I was when I when I rolled in. I'm going to roll this order by a bunch. And if I go faster, then it will never... Well, well it sort of will. Because I'm rolling faster than it can expects so it expects to roll in at three degrees per second i rolled up too roll out too far Pitch one I might change as well. Not entirely convinced by that one. I don't know. But no, it will not. Uh, so the problem, re the, the reason why you saw it snapping back there, because I'm basically, I have a cascade of two low pass, uh, two slow sort of following, two slow followers. So the primary role for flight director input is from the flight control computer. That one rolls in at three degrees per second, and that's what the flight control computer expects you to do. And then I have a secondary filter here in the display part. But it will no longer will no longer try and roll back. Hmm.
I don't know. Hmm. Yeah, hard to be sure. How's the audio level there? Yeah, pretty good. So in that case, I'll put this algorithm into the Heads Up Guidance computer as well. This does need actual color because I need to put in my proper white space types. Just say tabs instead of spaces. Good stuff. And instead of PFD data period, we're going to go HTC. Something like that. So HTC online 1500. All right, I forgot to replace you. We just keep on telling you that you're always on path, then we'll be perfect. Then we'll never sway anywhere. How about we do that? Uh, let's see. Heading mode disable. Load about there. the HUD there. I guess this works. Sort of anyway. Hmm. Let's go for a fun flight. Just at the tail end of the stream. Routing suggestions. Anybody? Got any ideas where I should go? Line. <clears throat> Let's see, what did you guys suggest previously? Hmm. Anybody get any suggestions for where I should go flying? LFMD circling. Sure, but I haven't I haven't fixed the sequencing bugs there yet and <clears throat> EPT Alpha. Hmm. 
could do. Do they have? No, they don't have any RMP good ones, eh? Yeah, no, they're all just straight in boring ones. Also known as the boring ones, anyway. Yeah, that's not the thing I wanted to see. That's the thing I wanted to see. Any other suggestions? I have no idea how many people are watching. Oh, 46 people. Um, Teterboro. France uses a load of EPTs instead. Yeah. <laughs> Albuquerque, Billings. That one's Centennial. Uh, visual procedure, uh, visual, visual points, or I guess visual procedure points, something like that. Visual procedure, right? That RMP approaches. I think I flew in there already once. Yeah, I did fly this in. Not this one, though. It'll be fun. I mean, like that, that, and just drop it in. Arrow Islands. We did this one, I think. Or one of these. Or no, this one, yeah, like that and the sharp turn in with the very low rollout. Because this is the normal one, and I think they say that over here it's very turbulent, so they basically just shortcut it in with the uniform procedure. My NDB cloud break. RMP vector. It's all fairly far away thing is if you want to fly to Vagar, you, you basically have to spend a fair amount of time on a route. I prefer something, I don't know, plus something where, where I haven't been before. We could do this one, I guess. What's the weather like? Ooh, bad. Rain, overcast, 200. Yeah, that ain't gonna happen. That'd be an ILS, if that. Winds out of the south, so that was that would favor landing south, but all these procedures are not, none of these are gonna take us down to 200. Yeah, not this one. Not this one. Localizer, definitely not. Yeah. Hmm. You could fly non real weather. Or I could just artificially, I guess, improve the weather on a final. Doing that X plane even does it. Ah, sure. If nobody else is suggesting anything else, uh, are we going to go from Aberdeen? AVG. About the northernmost Scottish city that kind of like has a good air or reasonably sized airport. Everything else here is either an Air Force base or LEAS. I don't think I know that one. Asturia. What are you? 10 9. Maybe you will make a bit shorter. EGPB. Well, yeah, but we can't take off there. <laughs> well, that's, uh, that's Hong Kong, isn't it? I mean, that one's 
fairly easy. Two large runways. I mean, approaches are in any kind of massively fascinating approaches there. No, it doesn't seem to be. Two five left RMP Zulu. Uh, it's a bit of a sharper turn in, but nothing too nothing too crazy. CGPD, I guess Aberdeen. Uh, Sumbra has a problem of being too short. Cause I mean, Challenger's t runway performance ain't bad, but it's it's not fifteen hundred meter. Well, it it probably could do fifteen hundred meters. Just about barely. That'll be marginal. <laughs> Guess if we don't have to fly far, we don't have to take much fuel. Ah, uh, sure, why not? Let's try that. So EGPB, Sombra, and where do we park? Not a helicopter. I guess that one will do. And we can take, I suppose, real weather. I'll make it not real time though. <laughs> like 1500 meters is doable on a Challenger. It's, you just can't take very much. Fortunately it is sea level. Uh, Oh crap, my nose wheel's turned. I have to deturn that one. So which runway will be take will be taken? Which one's the long one again? Yeah, runway three three probably. So we'll look at Z weather. So switch you on. Actually, what I want to do is I want to also run Simbrief here. So, new flight, actually. New flight. BIIS. That's... Yeah, that's quite far away. That's an hour flight. So... EGPB to EKVG. Now just let me do this. I'm going to take my Challenger here. I don't need any of that. Wow, talk about a... And I typed in the wrong identifier. EGPB. There we go. Very complicated route, as we can see. All three waypoints in there. Theoretically, I don't even need to generate a flight plan for this. I could just punch this in by hand. Okay. Oh, yeah, I forgot the, the emergency lights as I reset the airplane there. Anyway, do a quick squib test. Engine squib one, okay. Squib two, okay. Are we going to get a crash here if I go into failures? No oh, crap. No crash. Oh well. Jet pipe overheat. Good stuff. Remember for already? No, he doesn't. It, it doesn't. I created my own based off the their CL three hundred. Uh. 
Alrighty, Avail Light's gonna be coming on momentarily. There it is. Cool stuff. We wanna run checklists? Who cares? Alrighty, pull this guy back. Break is set, so we're gonna go ahead and get rid of the chocks. But actually, swing over. Yeah, no, that's well, nose wheel is too far canned over, so it, it won't let me. I have to basically give it power and straighten it with castering. Okay. So. Flight plan wise, what are we going to be doing here? So we're going for EGPB, EGPB to EKVG, execute. Next route is. We're not actually going to fly a departure. Well, I should fetch weather if we have it. Request terminal weather, Echo Gulf, Papa Bravo. And while I'm at it, might as well grab this one. Well, that's in progress. We don't have much anything else to do. I can pull in the fuel from the tanks. Simbrief suggested a flight level 360. A 230 mile trip. Still fetching? Yeah, still fetching. So, there we go. A link. Terminal weather. <clears throat> so. U204, so essentially no significant winds to the point where I'd have to limit my runway selection. So I'm going to select runway. Yeah, 33. It's closest. So flight 360. Routing wise, depart runway 33. No departures. And after that, the flight plan says we go to direct Sumbra VOR. S-U-M. Actually, I can type it on over here on this flight plan legs. Flight plan, direct PEMOS. Direct MY. So, PEMOS. Uh, not VIA. And direct Mike Yankee. NDB at EK. Yeah, EKVG, same thing. Oh, so it's exi it exists as both an NDB and a terminal waypoint. That's what that means. You know, there's a bunch of other ones, but I guess I'll take the NDB. Execute. So with the flight plan loaded. You're going to get a top of descend, a vertical profile, and all that good stuff. A predicted landing weight and fuel. But in fact, too much fuel for this trip, but that's fine. Forecast for our arrival. The light rain, mist, overcast 200. We're going to change that. 1016. That puts our local bearer. 1015. 1, 1, 1006 over there. 1015 here. So 1015. Good stuff. Gonna do an initial climb to 33 or flight level or 5,000 feet or what is that? The flight level at this point. I mean, there's not very much terrain around here. 324. So we've got the perf. What does it say for temperature? 13. 
So we got plenty of power available. Perfect is completed. Take off. All looking good. Like I said, it's. Not sure if I asked this before. What are camera moving key bindings? WASD. So yeah, that's why I can sort of quickly move around here. Not a problem at all. I use W A or sorry W S back and forth A D. Left and right, classic, you know, first person shooter stuff. And Q and E I'm using for up and down. And then I've got control versions of everything bound up. So this is for medium speed movement. And then shift and WASD for super slow movement. Okay. So thrusters, everything is operable on the airplane. So I'm happy with all of these. Like I said, it's, it's, there isn't too much margin on the airplane at this point. And if I was heavier, this would, would probably bust this or if it was hotter, but fortunately it's not very hot. It's sea level and we're not too heavy. So we'll do. Sweet. So other than that, we can go ahead and do all our little tests here. So you go and do your duck or rather so let's go like this, check everything here. Or do we do the double smile? I think they do it bef before start or after start. I for forgot. I think they do it before start. There you go like this. Make sure you got both. L2 aux, gravity cross flow open. R2 aux should close this one. Still beyond good. Cut off, this one should open. First gravity cross flow. R2 aux close. Cut off, and we got the lights. Good stuff. We got no fault light up there. In fact, we could do a quick test of the light. There we go. Duct monitor test. Bleed air. Duct. Loop A, loop B, ice detector test, wing test, wing overheat. Good stuff. Both of these to full on. Four OK lights, both off. And we want to make sure these are armed. This guy's armed. Don't need the logo light at day during day. And you got your anti-skid, which I'd have to test with the parking brake off. So I'm gonna request the chocks be put back in place. Anti-skid test, good. Set the parking brake again. Rid of the chocks here. And I before I press the parking brake, you check that you got that hydraulic pressure. The nose wheel steering is currently disarmed. That's all good. Gear bay overheat. Gear bay overheat. Fail test. Do a quick toss test. Slide slow. Pull up. Wind shear, wind shear. Then of course we'll do our oral warning. Terrain, terrain, pull up. Uh, the Jeep, the jet was has priority, so that's why it initially didn't do anything. Good stuff. Your stall warning test. Smoke detector. Smoke. And all your little lampy lamps. After that, I'm going to arm the stabilizer trim, yaw damper. All these are good. Centered, 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 left. 
And norm, norm, norm. Rock and roll. Let's go. So beacon on. Bleed on. I've got our oxygen system actually. I still got a test. Did Gordon animate those yet? No, he didn't. And these are broken again. <laughs> uh... <laughs> anyway, this is normal. Therapeutic oxygen is off. Got to implement the cockpit voice recorder. It looks like a mix between the CL30 and CRJ. <laughs> yeah, why is that, huh? Alrighty. All of these are ready to go. So, number two, spool them. Righty, second one, or number one, actually. Twenty-five, there we go. stuff we got two good engines so this guy can't come on and that's pretty much it we could do a bunch more tests like test the isolation valve here But I think I'm good for taxi. Yeah, let's go. Rock and roll. Speed, we've got the target set, 89.9. So, parking brake is off. I'm just going to go ahead and push in that guy. And in fact, I think I'm going to grab the FO's assists in the air. Actually, I'm also going to set speed target to 200. And I'm going to arm thrust traversers. And we got to get that nose wheel steering straightened out. So, parking brake is off. Actually, parking brake is off. And normal brakes are off. steering is straightened out I'm gonna turn on taxi lights huh now then I think we'll cross over here and then there's one, two, three. There we go. Pulling from the nose wheel steering. Yeah. So, anti collision. Nothing coming left or right. Fortunately.
Give me back my Rose Moda D. Here is our departure runway. PARA mode is on. A little bit of break here. And also check the thrust reversers. Seems to be working. Tutorials. Oh. Well. Oh yeah. What's the reality sim? Absolutely, he he did he does yeah. He's great ones. Definitely subscribe to him. And if you're already subscribed, then subscribe to him again. So let's take as much runway as we can. Probably could have pushed it a little bit further. Since we don't have much runway anyway, I'm not going to do a rolling start. I'm going to do a static run out. So, landing lights are on. This and that. Takeoff configure is okay. Roll up the trim a little bit more. Okay. Give me toga mode. Okay, ATS and brakes off. Looking for 89.9. There it is, 89.7. This truss is achieved. And rotate. change here. Autopilot. And heading hold. There's a thousand feet. Roll speed up to 210. Or above target speed plus five accelerating. So flaps are up. I'm going to set this over to pulse mode at this point. Go ahead and select climb trust. Yeah, if I was going to clean up the aircraft after first. takeoff actions, that speed 250. I'm going to make an on course turn here. Let's see, heading 300 and resume on navigation. So I'm going to go into the legs page here and I'm just going to activate the leg from sum to Hemos that will make us intercept that leg there arm nav mode L nav 1 is armed and we'll go ahead and continue our climb up at 360 Six zero set. Get the headset on. Obviously, this is what you're ready. I program myself. I've explored the XPSDK. It is a well documented. I was planning on work, work on some plugins. It's a fairly straightforward affair in terms of what the SDK can do for you. So yeah, you shouldn't be worried about that. Get a perf. Resume two fifty. What you're gonna like if you're, especially if you code in like C or C plus plus, is it's a completely programmatically accessible system. So you, there's no weird protocols or anything you have to deal with. 
Not like, you know, uh, SIM connect or, or proprietary tool chains. Nothing like that. Actually, landing lights can come off. 250, so there's 10,000 speed, 270. And as our nose lowers below 10 degrees, I can go ahead and turn off the fasten seat belts. going to have all that much of a cruise anyway. I we might just amend my cruise altitude down to 340. It wouldn't make sense to try and pull ourselves up all that far. So flight 360, enter. It's going to pull these a little bit further apart. I want at least about 80 miles in the cruise. It doesn't really make much sense to go higher than that. In fact, 320 would probably have been enough, but already set for three four. There's really not all that much. So a uh, virtual BD pilot, if you go to developer.x-plane.com, that is gonna give you, they've got a truckload of resources for everything. So, uh, you want to create aircraft or you want to code plugins, doesn't really matter. This is going to teach you more about how to use the airplane maker tool and, and world editor. Uh, if you want to code plugins, um, there you go. And they've got a ton of samples for how to do various things. Of course, um, you got your general documentation stuff. One of the neat things about X-Plane of course, it depends on what you want to do. Uh, one of the neat things about X-Plane is that it gives you, first of all, most things in the sim can be changed or read by the DataRef interface. Uh, so there should be code plugins that are basically there for you to, you can basically copy you know, ready-made samples for that. Um, So stuff like, you know, eh, I did not have a dedicated you know, array data refs. So data refs are simply an interface for uh, reading data that is owned by a particular you know, piece of piece of code inside of the simulator. It doesn't mean that's the only way to share code. You, you can use others, but that is generally the accepted most portable approach. Are the samples in C? Yes, they are. And actually C and or C++, one of those. If you can't read one, you can read the other. But yeah, things, uh, let's see, hello world SDK. You know, just open up a window, punch something in there. And this is the, this is the whole sample, basically. And generally most plugins are follow a very simple, they basically all, uh, plugins in Explain are um, dynamic libraries, right? So they'll load into the sim as a dynamic library, which means you are running in context of the simulator. You got access to the entire memory space. Uh, you can exchange data extremely efficiently. Um, and uh, yeah, it's, it's basically a non-issue. Um, when it comes to how do you drive stuff? So one of the things is that the SDK is fundamentally single single threaded. So that means if you're, I mean, if you're only ever not going to worry about multi-threading, then it's not not a concern. But if you are, you have to keep in mind that you can only exchange data with the simulator on the main thread. You can still create your own threads, do stuff you need, which is what I do in the Challenger. But you cannot call the SDK functions from anything other than the main simulator thread. So schedule your data exchanges accordingly. Um, fundamentally, the SDK is essentially callback based, right? So you'll register your, there's an, a start and a stop callback and there's a 
being able to disable and receive message callbacks. These are the five mandatory callbacks you have to have in your plugin. And that's what the simulator calls um, when, when it loads your plugin in. And inside of that, you can then register other stuff. You can create windows, you can create what they call a flight loop callback, where the simulator would call you every simulator, you know, time frame. Uh, you could call, you could generate a draw callback <clears throat> and register a bunch of callbacks to fetch data at strategic, strategic points um, inside of the simulator. Um, yeah, that's pretty much it. There's, and then you can, of course, read and write data from other plugins via data refs or, or the simulator itself. You can invoke commands. Commands are essentially how the simulate, how the user typically, uh, usually how the user interfaces with the simulator. So when, for instance, I click here on this, this click spot to pop up the window, or if I show you what all the click spots are. Um, hang on, show us your click regions. So all these, these are pieces of geometry that have associated commands um, with them. So. The command is a an action that the user can take and you can respond to in code. So you can register a callback. Hey, when this command occurs, call me and let me know. You know if Laminar is going to update the API for XP12, I don't know what want to do any double go. No, no, XP12 will be backwards compatible fully and uh, you will not lose any work for sure. Uh, in fact, if anything, there's only going to be, I mean, the SDK has existed for at least since XP8, probably XP7 at this point, or XP6, somewhere around there. And you can still, inside of Xplane 11, you can load Xplane 9 plugins just fine, provided that they don't like try and do crazy stuff. Generally, they will work. So in terms of like backwards compatibility, the, the, the SDK is rock solid. Now, if you wanna do some sophisticated stuff like graphics that might tie into how the simulator draws, that might not work because simply the underlying platform has changed. You know, when you're trying to do OpenGL, when you're trying to do some OpenGL trickery in 3D inside of the simulator and the simulator's rendering pipeline has changed over to Vulkan, then that's going to be a little bit complicated. But yeah, cool. Really good version. It aged like fine wine, didn't it? Um, but the idea basically is that the sim doesn't really change all well the sdk itself hasn't changed in years and years and years probably decades at this point so don't be worried about backwards compatibility or forwards compatibility it's not like your plugin is all of a sudden going to hit a, a binary incompatibility issue where the sim will just refuse to load it it's not going to be that don't worry in fact xp12 is essentially xplane 11 plus nicer graphics if, as far as I can tell. Um, the flight model is already available in X-Plane 11. That's going to be an XB-12. Um, all the flight dynamics are, and the data if interface for air aircraft is going to be the same. Um, the GUI interfaces for creating windows and drawing your own graphics in, inside of them, that's the same. So no, from a backwards compatibility point of view, you're not going to have any trouble. In fact, in fact, I don't expect any broke, don't fix it. Exactly. That's one thing I really, really, really like about Xplain is, <clears throat> unlike Microsoft Flight Simulator, how they confirmed Austin makes no changes to the flight model. Um, JSNAP, um, as far as I know, basically what we have in Xplain 11, what they labeled as the 1140 flight model, the experimental flight model, is going to be the XP-12 flight model going forward. So... You can already test aircraft on the new flight model. It's just you set up to use the experimental flight model, which I've, which we've been using in X-Plane already in the TBM since some update, and in the challenge, the challenge has already been developed with it from the start. Hopefully, it stays busy with weather. Perhaps oh, we'll see. So there we go. Cruise level achieved. Nice crosswind, 80 knots. Got a bunch of crab in there. And yeah. And we're accelerating up to Mach 0.80 is what, what I had set as my um, cruise speed. So VNAV setup, there we go. Cruise selected speed Mach 0.80. Already got the other modes working. So 
LRC is working and Max Cruise is working. Ah, or maybe not. Maybe I hit a bug. Damn it. Backtrace. Okay. Huh. Well then. Reload the sim quickly. <laughs> As I then am going to fix this bug later on. Am I crossing the Atlantic today or something? I think this might be the record for stream length so far. No, I'm not. No, not debug time this time. I'm, I'm going to just carry on. I'll, I'll fix it later. Since I have state um, save and restore and auto save working in the development version here, I'm just going to wait and let it place me back where I was. Just realign the IRS is there. And we, we're back in business. Nose door. Yeah, yeah don't worry. Nose door. Is there a trick I'm missing? The reload plugins update in DL that doesn't seem to work for me in Linux for non aircraft plugins. Um, so the issue you're probably seeing there is because. What are you talking about? This one? Reload aircraft? Do so you have auto save? Yes, I do, Sparkle. Uh, JSNAP, what do you mean for like. DLL and Linux, he means like shared object stuff, a library, anything. Data Ref tool can call XP on reload plugins. Um, you'll want to make sure, you snap, that you've deleted the original file. Well, I mean, if you're already, if you just rebuild it, it should work fine. I mean, for me, it works. All I just do is I have the code here sim linked. So if I show you my desktop. Uh, if I go to X plane uh, aircraft X aviation CL 650 dev, you'll see we have plugins systems, and that's all it is. It's just a sim link into my development directory for get um, to to get the latest build in there. Don't seem to load a new one. Ah, uh, right. Hang on. You're you're writing in C plus plus, aren't you? Ha uh -huh, ha you hit a problem. Well, not really a problem. Copy, is that not valid? Uh, copy is fine. You're, you, the problem is you're developing at C++, aren't you? Yeah. Rixie. I know why. So C++ has some features that tend to fuck with reloading of libraries on, at runtime. Um, I keep forgetting. It's it's like GNU, F, no, no GNU unique or something like that. Um, and C plus uh, plus. So one of the problems is C plus plus has features that are built into the language, which in order to support them working correctly, um, basically the compiler has to mark the binary in such a way that it cannot be unloaded. And it primarily has to do with multi-threading and thread native primitives in C++. I could start in C and then fully evolve. So you're, yeah, the problem is essentially in the fact that you're, um, it basically stems from the fact that um, when you use, you give me a direction of looking, yeah, yeah. Um, look, uh, look for, Google for, um, C++, uh, GNU Unique, GNU Unique, and Library Reloading. Look for these keywords and it'll typically find this. There's a bunch of options you can give to the compiler to try and work around this, but certain corner cases cannot be easily solved or, or certain features cannot be implemented or cannot be used this way if you still want to be able to reload the library. It has primarily to do with uh, C++ native threads and uh, mutex static initializers. I'm sorry, thread local storage and static, static mutex initializers. Primarily, I think, with thread local storage. Uh, one, of the neat, one of the unfortunate things about that is that this requires... And by the way, look at this. Um, so 
Here's the N1 sync feature of the auto throttle. So Trison keeps both throttles, both N1 speeds roughly in sync. You can see there's a slight split in the throttles, but not very much. And uh, to that end, we, we don't really get that wah, 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 wah in the in the cabin. They're very, very close together, you know, a few RPMs apart. But consequently, we might not actually get the same N2 speeds and different ITTs. That's just normal. That's the way it's supposed to work. Anyway, I got to start preparing for a descent here. You know, getting closer, 15 miles away. Anyway, anyway so the problem is essentially thread local storage um, requires some static initialization functions which need to be called only once. And in order to make sure that they are only ever, ever, ever called once, compiler has to flag certain symbols in the binary, or rather the linker has to flag certain uh, symbols in the binary with what they call unique symbols. And therefore the runtime linker, when it loads the library, it cannot unload the library anymore because they get, um, yeah, the symbols would get then reinitialized and they would basically break thread local storage. Yep, but that only works in case you weren't using too many, I'd say, yeah. Uh, it requires that you're not using too many crazy features. Certain features you simply cannot use, like thread local storage stuff, I think simply cannot be done without new unique uh, or the unique loader flag. And that basically takes care of that. So we got a vertical deviation here. We bring up the FMS. It's going to start telling us, hey, um, we might think about, you know, vertical deviations coming down from above. Check altitude select. Like, do you actually want to descend, dude? Um, if, if you do, you got to reset the altitude preselector down because we're still, if we don't, it's not going to descend. So to get rid of that message, we just reset the altitude preselector down and the message is gone. And that's all I basically need to do. Let's say we got cleared down to flight level 230 for the time being. And other than that, we can just basically relax. There we go, five seconds to top of descent. The path, and the airplane's gonna start down. A little bit, don't need to reload that much anymore these days, but man, it would be handy to put some future coins. I wanna write more quickly. Yeah. Um, that's unfortunately the only way to do it if you're using C++. Try and avoid that unique symbol generation. Doesn't work 100%, but it looks good with all in the sim. Yeah, it definitely does. Starting to look, there's still a missing floor and some seats, but yeah, she she getting there. This door needs to be over there. Yeah, these are not supposed to float here. Power must be out before opening panel. No oh, shit. So, what are we going to try here? The elevator shows that this plane must be really thrilled with it. Yes, hopefully. <laughs> I mean, we don't pay them, so we're always appreciative, actually, of any testing they do. The guys are absolutely pulling through for us. The amount of help we've gotten, we could never have made the airplane half as good as it is. So EKVG, we want to go which one? Not that one. Perhaps this one. How low is that going to get us? 330 feet. Above 330. And that's about it. What's the difference between them? This approach maybe. This approach goes 4,000 RMP. This approach to Magni hold. Uh, I can't tell the difference between them. Let's just go ahead and load one of them in. So RMP 
is RMP Whiskey Runway 1-2. Okay. RMP Whiskey 1-2. From Suter Actually, no. For us, a better approach would be coming from Rover. That's going to make it very non spicy, so I'm just going to go from Suter anyway. And I want to give the airplane something to do. So go direct suitor. Her. So it's reverted out of the pitch here. And let's go. Can we go vertical direct? Up thousand there. Would that be a 2.16 degree? Yeah, sure. The path. Lovely stuff. It's awesome coming back after a few months and seeing the progress. Oh yeah. I've just done a manual uh, vertical direct too, so the thing is just gonna steer us at the waypoint that I've selected here. At 12.947. Just because I can. And I could delete both of these now if I wanted to, but that would reset our vertical path. I'm essentially a little, little bit low here uh, because I've added track miles to the path. And that means that would have, I would not have had to be, you know, that high up, but whatever, close enough. So I basically just have to shallow the descent out here a little bit. Yeah, other than that, we can just go ahead and... So this is required GPS, so we should be inside of Agnos coverage. Oh yeah, 230, so let's keep on coming down. Roll this guy down to like, I don't know, 6K. 6,000, sure. RMP final approach, 0 0.1 nautical miles required. When did I code this? I don't even remember. I think it's correct, but I don't remember anymore. My actual, my estimated position on certainty right now is 0 0.01. And if we look over on the GPS panel here, stuff. We are in SBAS PA, so we are satellite-based augmentation system, precision approach capable, inside of Agnos service coverage, and our guaranteed uncertainty from the Agnos service is 13 meters horizontally, 19 meters vertically, um, and we require, or the approach is 0 0.1 nautical miles, so plenty inside of that. And W just 84 limits field saying there are all waypoints. Uh, they're all currently in WGS 84 model. Uh, I don't support WGS 84, non WGS 84 airports. It, that, I mean, there's like five of them in the air in the whole world anyway, so who gives a crap? But yeah. We can also check the RAIM status availability. So this is just checking for satellite service availability at our time of arrival which is predicted at 12541255 thereabouts. Um, so if we were expected to arrive at a different point, I can manual punch that in, let's say. Actually, we're gonna be waiting, uh, we're gonna be delayed for, for 15 minutes, so let's go ahead and or 20 minutes. I can select that and it'll query the GPS units and the GPS units say, yeah, we're still good. And the GPS units actually check 15 minutes prior and 15 minutes after, so there's like a half hour window. Yeah, continue. And it doesn't just it, it doesn't just cheat. This actually does perform the rain check. So this is the this is one of the debug screens for one of the GPS units. In fact, we can show them both. But so this is the GPS unit operating. 
satellite constellation currently and I can if I go ahead and type in this is the these are the queries coming in from the flight management computer for the two times so you can see the status time so 1300 and 1330 is what it checked 15 minutes prior 15 minutes after oh or the stats model in XP does a sim no the simulator doesn't do anything with that I do <laughs> this is my code like I said before, uh, I'm not using x for anything other than the aerodynamics. That's it, nothing more. So, this is real satellite data. If I was flying in real time, this would actually correspond one-to-one to, one to exactly where the satellites are in the real world. Real world. Since I'm flying at custom time, they don't, obviously. We have 14 satellites above our horizon, and we are... Currently, the GPS unit is receiving how many? Seven. You can see that over here. It's locked onto seven satellites. Well, thanks, x -Plane, for the weather reload. And there's a lot more in here. So, for instance, we download... Give me a hard on... <laughs> We download the real map of position dilutions in the real world. So I basically interpolate ima this image and figure out what your satellite data precision is at this point. At any given point, we download that every few minutes. Um, then inside of the GPS here, we've also got, we look on the GNSS satellite service, uh, the, the SBAS service status. So EGNOS horizontal precision limits and EGNOS vertical precision limits. This is downloaded once every 10 minutes or so. And I basically blend these two, uh, these data sets together to figure out, you know, where you're gonna, where, where are you gonna get EGNOS coverage and what level of quality. And uh, let's see what else we got. Obviously, we got the same thing for WAS, so this would be for if you were in WAS coverage. Since I'm not, I don't, I'm not going to bother you with that, but yes, I do have WAS service as well, simulated. Are these free APIs? Well, yeah, the interfaces for downloading these are available. Um, the, the APIs are available. So, yeah, if you want, I can show, I can tell you what the URLs are. Predictive rain we can only do on the ground, so I'm not going to bother with that. Ooh, that's a typo. CNSS control. That's supposed to say GNSS control. I'll just put a reminder in there for myself. Actually, I could just probably fix it right away. L21 IAPS, FMC subsystem. Let's see, subsystem, FPLN, ERAME, CNSS, yeah, it's supposed to say GNSS here. Hey, got that fixed. Anyway, so let's put you back to default. 1254, good. And if it deviates by more than, I think, a minute or two, uh, we do another rain check. So it's automatic, basically. You don't have to do anything about it. Okay, how are we looking on the flight director here? Yeah, it's, it's performing about what I would expect it to do. Okay, slowing down a already once preset for a reset for the new altimeter there. Is our weather briefing still there? KVG 1006. So just reminding me that I gotta reset the altimeter there because I'm below transition altitude or level here for this airport. If it is published in the data sets that it will use it. And since we're entering cloud here, I'm going to go and turn on synthetic vision. 
VL we cap. We shouldn't be stopping here, buddy. Oh, come on. This is something I gotta fix. I shouldn't have stopped at that vertical constraint. No, oh, right, hang on. I took it out of auto FMS speed. Get a bunch of break here. Are there speed constraints on this thing? There's one over there. Yeah, HUD's not going to do very much for us here. Have a good one, Virtual BD. See you later. Minimums. Just quickly punch those in. Your C category, one five, uh, five nine four. So five sixty for us. Refs. Barrow. Five sixty. Okay, coming back up on the path. I'm gonna capture it soon. In range, Spartan APU. Thank you, Mr. Fl First Officer. So, PG814, B180 or less. And then 812 is speed 160 or less. Good stuff. Come on, V path capture already. There we go. He's already, the first officer is already. That's stock class. Yeah, that's stock. Um, EC doesn't support X, uh, doesn't support Linux at this time, so I'm only limited to stock. Alrighty, since we're inside of the approach, we've got everything met. We'll go ahead and arm approach mode here. RMP mode is armed over here and unseated, also on the HUD. So as soon as we get to the final approach fix, which I'm guessing is going to be this guy here. You can kind of guess at it. Nope, that's not yet. Yet. This one, alrighty. So probably this 812 is the final approach fix. So as soon as we get to it, uh, sequences onto it, it's going to uh, arm the approach mode. So slowing down any further is going to be hard with no speed brakes, everything. So I'm going to go ahead and select flaps 20. Okie doke. Oh, EC does. Okay. Yeah, but I don't want to, you know, destroy my frame rates.
transition and bleeds onto APU. Ooh, it's a little bit loud. Okay. APU PAX transition is completed. Still pressurizing down or, you know, depressurizing actually, so that's all good. So VG814. That's speed 180. VG812 is speed 160. I'm going to take it from there. And VG812 is our final approach fix. So you'll see as soon as it sequences through the final approach fix, probably it's going to already go into glide path mode. Maybe. We gotta wait for until we're out of VG one two. I don't know. We shall see. Actually, not two thousand. That one's gonna be the final approach fix, huh? Eight oh six. So select laps thirty. Oof, you getting hammered here. Those clouds. I didn't do a, the approach perf. OAT, what are you, OAT over here? 11. Send. Good stuff. A thousand feet to go. You're really gonna make me wait until I'm all the way at eight one zero to engage flight path mode. So here we go, VGP finally. Got the miss approach here, four thousand. Here down. VREF plus, we've got 50 knots of crosswind, so I'm just going to add about 7 knots on top. And flaps 45. One bazillion billboard clouds, yes sir. Three and a half degree slope. we hit the minimums before we get down I'll just continue on anyway 1, there should be a final turn to the right get us aligned with the runway you can see over there on the synthetic vision and coming up to that turn Middle marker. Approaching minimums. 
I'll just punch it down. I don't care. Oh, there we go. Minimums. Perfect. I couldn't have planned it better. This is a stupid airport. I forgot how crooked the thing is in X plane. Like it's crooked in real life, but not that far. Yeah, it's a bit too that's a bit too much. Yeah, except for that level off there which it shouldn't have done. I'm glad we broke out though just about. Couldn't have planned it better myself. Let's not discuss that landing. Can I pass no? The turn off's over here. I forgot what my landing soft flat runways look like. Here testing, it's fine. stuff we got the APU um, bus all that other stuff we can go ahead and kill that's where the doors closed I know <clears throat> Reiner does business trips now. Oh, come on, it ain't that bad. Cool. So, we're going to park it here. And we're going to wrap it up. Sweet. Will the rest of the cockpit modeling be complete or is it being worked on? It's being work worked on. Use any add ons for the sky? No, ask right on. Right in delivery. This was fun, thanks. Well, yep. Cool. Brakes are set. So just get the shutdown out of the way here. Just these guys out. And. Put that in. All the rest is good. Perfect.
cool. So, I'll talk to you later, guys. Hey, everybody. Take care. Uh, later, skaters. <laughs> and, yeah. We'll have more Challenger soon. Hey, everybody, have a good one. Take care, good night, and see you around. Goodbye.